Today, I'm going to be delivering the first of three talks uh, regarding our work on COVID-19 support of the health system. Um, today's talk uh, is going to provide a broader uh, view on the effort, um, which uh, is going to provide uh, just a brief glimpse of the many lines of specific technical work that contributed to this enterprise, uh, while emphasizing broader learnings, uh, discussion of barriers, um, uh, points of reflection and insight uh, that arose, and really telling, telling the broader story, um, which is, is quite unusual and quite, quite extraordinary in some ways of what's transpired in the past 14 or so months. Um, subsequent talks, uh, likely to in number, will, uh, will be hitting on specific lines of technical work. So if you're looking for nitty gritty of um, understanding precisely how we used, for example, particle filtering in the course of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the greatest insights on that will be coming from uh, a, later, a later talk in the next few weeks. This talk has a decidedly broader focus. Now, um, in light of that, you may be surprised that we've set aside a two hour slot. And there's really two reasons for that. The first is I wanna ensure there's time for discussion and questions, um, which you know, I prefer um, absent um, a, uh, a critical issue that comes up during the talk to leave till uh, to the end of the talk. But the second is, you know, once I started um, reflecting on uh, the, the learnings from this project and, and recounting in my own mind uh, what's transpired, um, it was clear there was a lot of texture there. And even just enumerating at a 30,000 foot level the different lines of technical work is going to require a fair bit of time. And then uh, stepping back and, and um, you know, pausing to, to ponder the, um, the broader implications of all this and where it's going um, will, also, will also require uh, time to really explicate. So we will use, um, for better or for worse, and with my condolences, um, uh, the large majority of that time, I think, we'll, we'll probably go to an hour and a, close to an hour and a half just for the talk alone. Um, I will keep myself absolutely no longer of that, so we have we're sure to have uh, half an hour for for discussion. Um, okay, so um, within this talk, I'm going to be discussing the CEPHAL Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab. COVID-19 contributions. Um, these were contributions made to our health system writ large um, with a, a scope and geographic extent to them that extended beyond this continent. Um, and we're going to, to concentrate on a lot of the, the contributions to our provincial system while acknowledging um, and uh, giving occasional nods to the, the broader um, the broader contribution set. Uh, the, our work in this area took place in the context of uh, a lab that um, uh, was uh, humming along. Um, this is a picture from just prior to the COVID-19 pandemic from uh, December 2019, um, just before Le, de Le Deluge. Uh, and um, oh, none of us knew at the time what what challenge we were lined up for. I've, I've taken the liberty of um, putting these red halos around the various parties who ended up contributing to uh, the COVID-19 um, COVID um, enterprise and uh, either on a full-time basis or part-time for all of the year or, or for, for part of that. Uh, some of those people weren't in the original picture um, but were hired by virtue of uh, contracts and funds and needs that came up during the pandemic. But collectively you could see it, it, it encompassed a large fraction of our, um, of our lab. 
uh, and uh, there's a continued entanglement of some of these individuals, uh, for example, uh, those shown down here within our, our continued reporting. Um, I, I'd like to tell a little bit about the chronology. This, this actually has some, um, some interesting uh, components to it. And um, there's uh, a bit of a, um, of a drama associated with what went on once one starts to recount the, um, the early phases of this work. Um, so this work uh, took place in and uh, truncated in a most uh, uh, uncomfortable and rude fashion, my sabbatical. Um, and, and the saga really begins with my, um, my relocation to Boston in early, uh, early January, 2020 for my sabbatical, which I was going to divide between MIT, working on category theory and Harvard School of Public Health, uh, where I work um, out of a lab focused uh, on leveraging big data and, and to a lesser degree modeling. Um, now, uh, in the course of the first few weeks, I was focused on a, uh, a course in applied category theory for programming and was spending that time in the MIT campus. And on the 23rd, I received notice uh, of um, something unusual going on in Wuhan, China. Uh, uh, something um, strange enough that, that it was leading to the blockages of all people leaving Wuhan, China at the time of uh, travel for the Chinese New Year. And I knew something unusual was afoot and it was probably linked to a public health crisis and my, my ears weren't actually peaked. Um, however, at the time I was, uh, I was uh, going back and forth to the MIT campus and um, my thoughts were in category theory and its application to modeling and, and functional programming, uh, uh, which required a great deal of my attention. On the research side, a lot of my interest was in um, uh, fleshing out uh, some of our work with uh, antimicrobial resistance um, for a society of risk management, um, a risk analysis presentation I had to make the following week. And so I, I put down some um, scribbles on, on one of the MIT boards together with category theory components, um, some thinking on modeling AMR. Um, and uh, at the time I, I headed in on the 23rd, not knowing what was going to hit me, um, took a picture of a point of uh, emotional significance for me at MIT, not least because when I was a little kid, one of my very first memories is running in this area of East Campus uh, when my father was a doctoral student in the physics program at MIT. And uh, I was gaining some uh, childhood exercise probably at three or four at the time. <coughs> now, <coughs> on the 23rd, um, having received that, that initial alert, uh, I was looking for more information on the 24th, Winchell and uh, Winchell Chen and, and uh, Lu Jiajuan reached out to me about the Wuhan outbreak and um, noted its tie in with the uh, Wuhan seafood market, um, uh, some lines of converging evidence about it. And um, I thought, okay, this is, is very much a concern. And uh, on the 27th, uh, having followed the situation a bit more, I ordered a set of masks for delivery uh, to both Boston and Saskatoon for my lab here, uh, for uh, my family in uh, Boston. Uh, my, my parents are there, my brother, uh, and for myself for, for my uh, return trip. Uh, on the 4th, I convened a group in COVID-19 uh, of, of uh, folks from within my, uh, my lab to work on COVID-19. Um, this group had a strong representation of Chinese speakers at the time, um, which was partially a reflection of the interest from the group and partly a reflection of their accessibility, uh, th their ability to, to access the uh, emerging evidence. Um, and uh, we kicked off a set of modeling efforts, including agent-based modeling and particle filtering model, which is sustained to this day, which has contributed hugely. Um, now, in late January and early February, I was still caught up with, uh, with category theory and uh, making my way to the MIT campus, but increasingly did so with masks on. And I was um, 
I took note of the fact that many of the Chinese visitors for whom who make pilgrimages to MIT on a, on a continual basis were now masked. And I, I took that as a sign that they too were aware of, of an emerging situation. Um, on the 14th, I returned in a masked fashion to Saskatoon, leaving the rest of my N95 masks behind. Um, and knowing that we had a large complement from my lab of both N95 and surgical masks. Um, short, in short order after that, within the next week, uh, there were the first set of deaths uh, outside of China, um, in Korea, and then in Italy, um, which presaged the start of, of some major outbreaks in each country. And I was keenly aware that we were living on borrowed time. Um, the literature, the um, concerns at this point were overwhelmingly in China. And I had been reached out to by Chinese collaborators to help them um, inform Chinese authorities with managing this uh, from several, several lines of collaborators. But my concern was, was on Canada and making sure that our health system will be able to respond to this. And on the 24th of February, we had our first in-person meeting of our working group um, to, to try to confront the challenges of COVID-19. And at that time, while welcoming efforts to understand the situation in China and to tap into the rich data sources on mobility and social our media. Our generation does it backwards. We have kids and then. Sorry? Sorry? Okay, um, maybe, uh, maybe that wasn't intended for me. Um, on the 27th and 28th, we had um, uh, reach out from several, from three different parties with uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, and uh, one of them was uh, in a drive down, which would form part of my entry slide, my uh, drive down to Regina with Jenny Bazran, uh, the senior information officer for the health authority and the head of digital health there where she and I talked about the implications of the emerging, uh, the emerging um, outbreaks and epidemic, uh, what was soon to be declared a, a pandemic in, in March. Um, and uh, based on these multiple lines of reach out and um, an arranged uh, meeting whereby I spoke to the, to the um, assembled uh, medical health officers for the province, the frontline public health individuals, I decided that I would need to sacrifice my sabbatical to serve the province. And I did so and began my secondment on uh, March 5th. Uh, amazingly, um, during my travels, I traveled uh, back from Boston. I saw exactly one person with a mask that entire trip, um, despite being at hubs of mixing of international flights. On a uh, trip to Edmonton to work with the Edmonton Police Service and back on the Community Solutions Accelerator, I saw nobody with masks. And I was aware of the drum beats of the approaching, um, the approaching pandemic. And what Jenny and I worked out, um, talked about on that trip, termed entirely prescient. Um, you know, at the time, we sort of examined writ large, where is this likely to go? And whether it was the issue of lockdowns, whether it was the issue of variants and, and their emergence, whether it was the issue of, of the burden of long-term care, uh, the impact on, on, uh, on, on the most uh, frail and elderly, on other vulnerable populations like incarcerated populations, homeless populations, indigenous peoples, et cetera. You know, it was, it was all bang on. This is the work we do, and you know these are the the fault lines, the seams that through which so many of the harms inflicted by by uh, health issues, whether chronic or infectious, play a role. And I must say that we saw it with a pretty clear light, although we weren't specific about the details. Um, much of our attention was still on 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 China and making sense of the evidence coming out of there, much of which was in in Chinese. And uh, we actually undertook some translation from Chinese to English to help our health system know what to plan for with PPEs, with personal protective equipment in the hospitals and long-term care, what you need for safe intubation, and forwarded that to various members of our acute care system, leveraging um, the, the Chinese language expertise uh, that we could bring to bear. 
and had a lot of gratitude for that. Um, uh, now, um, on the 27th and 28th, uh, I attended a, a meeting at Ministry of Health, which was on other areas, but there was interest because people heard I was working on COVID-19, this kind of novel new uh, blip on the horizon. And I spoke about the need for leveraging novel data sources more broadly, like social media, like um, data from uh, mobile devices um, and, and location information. Uh, and wastewater data, et cetera, um, to, to people's surprise, but interest, all of which would become highly relevant in coming years. And a lot of the people around the table who I didn't know from Adam at the time, for many of them became my closest colleagues uh, in the ensuing months. And some that I did know became my partners in this work like Jenny Basman. Um, so what came out of this, out of those kind of formative weeks, um, was a very proactive look that turned into the Saskatchewan COVID-19 Advanced Analytics uh, Program of Work, um, which was institutionalized within the health, health authority, but with joint reporting to the Ministry of Health uh, as well. These are two very different organizations. They're different in their points of focus. They're different in their decision-making apparatus and their structure and uh, in their relationship to the broader government. Um, we had oversight from both sides, and um, this secondment finished uh, officially on a full-time basis end of December, on a part-time basis end of March, and con continues on a contract basis uh, through uh, a student of mine, Kirk Kruger, who, who you'll hear more about, um, and on a courtesy basis for our reporting to this day. Um, we were embedded in the health system, myself and uh, quite a few of my students. Um, now, while we were embedded formally within the SHA, um, we ended up serving a wide variety of, of clients. Um, the health system was uh, the first at the table, but Public Health Agency of Canada reached out for us um, in early March. And um, in summer, the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada with, um, with oversight for Indigenous health issues um, Yukon Territory, uh, Alberta Health Services on an ongoing basis, uh, the Australian Capital Territory with whom we have uh, very good working relationships in other areas as well, and most recently University of Saskatchewan. These are all clients for our work, uh, most of them on an active basis, some like the Australian Capital Territories not being an awfully big need because they manage the situation well, unless unlike uh, unlike certain other jurisdictions. Um, so uh, health system use of our models uh, has spanned the gamut. And uh, I recognize that those who don't interact with the health system may uh, view these from a distance like a point source. They may kind of glom together in your mind, but they're actually very, very different. And this work required us to really sweat those differences. Um, so just to enumerate some of the major needs for this sort of modeling, and to differentiate them a bit in people's understanding so you can appreciate the lines of modeling that were responsive to different subsets of these. There were capacity planning estimates, sort of, you know, do we need field hospitals? Um, how many PPEs do we require? Um, how many people do we need to do contact tracing? Um, you know, will we be uh, okay with um, the number of ventilators we have or do we have to get more? Um, uh, to what degree do we need more uh, teams on the ground to do door-to-door -door screening in the north, et cetera? These are capacity planning estimates to give some ballparks for them to know what to invest. And these are big ticket items where, you know, $50 million could go out the door by, um, that doesn't need to if you overestimate, but lots of people could die if you underestimate. They're, they're very sensitive uh, factors. Um, Another need was um, to understand the current epidemiology and project it forward, um, particularly in the, in the short term, but also some in the long term. Where is this headed? Where is it likely to head in the next few weeks? Are we likely to exceed our capacity in our ICU within the next month? Um, uh, to what degree are, um, are we going to be safe in terms of uh, having enough contact tracers on, on, on hand um, or in terms of our lab needs. 
Uh, so a lot of it was focused on risk of overrunning certain, certain thresholds. Some of it is just to understand the underlying situation because it's not at all obvious. You see cases and people focus on cases, but few cases can be a good sign or can be a very bad sign uh, because cases often come in electively. And in many cases of outbreaks, very few, finding very few cases was a very bad sign because it meant that there was a lot of sick people out there that weren't presenting for care. And that was a major, major issue because some of them would often present for care in a horrible state later and be much worse off because of it and, and much more critical and would transmit in the meantime. So really understanding what's really going on underneath the, the, the surface. Uh, how many undiagnosed people are there likely to be out there, for example, and circulating? How many people are getting infected, never, never mind getting reported? These are really big issues. Uh, another sizable need, something that we thought was the most valuable thing we brought to the table, but which actually ended up not being used nearly as much as we really would have liked. Right. Was what if what? Um, these are scenarios to ask what if questions. You know, um, What if we reopened uh, the borders for flights? What if we were to put in place this public health order compared to that one? Um, what if we were to respond with more teams for contact for for door to door screening in Lalash Clearwater outbreak? What if we could get into more colonies for for uh, contact tracing? How much would that help reduce the spread of infection outside of the colonies, et cetera? These what if scenarios are part and parcel of really good modeling. There there are a lot of the the biggest reasons people use modeling, but they weren't something that was um, foremost in a lot of people's minds early on who saw models as kind of more things to give projections um, to their loss. Um, uh, another thing we, we our models were used for was to communicate with communities, um, to uh, communicate the importance of mask wearing, for example, by showing scenarios with and without mask wearing to community members and motivate mask wearing. And I'm happy to say our model was very useful in this regard and motivated incredible levels of mask use in Saskatchewan's North um, in, in uh, a community's hard hit early on in the pandemic. Um, uh, we were told that the results of our model were very helpful for that motivating um, element. Now, uh, another big component was regular reporting, like daily reporting on what's the current situation and uh, where's it likely to go in the very short term. Doing some sensitivity analysis, figuring out how much is not knowing about this gonna bite us. Um, and to some degree, looking at how much do certain types of venues or gatherings impose risks. In all of this work, there were huge constraints we were living with. Um, and a lot of the modeling was geared at um, informing and understanding how to work around these constraints or how to live within these constraints, what we could best do given these constraints. Um, you know, at a broad level, there are human resource constraints. Um, we see those to this day, but they've changed in their, in their issues over the time. Um, Local and provincial testing capacity, lab capacity was a big one uh, early on. Um, delays, uh, a pronounced one, um, uh, you know, with wastewater concentration estimates, we're still dealing with a minimum of five day turnaround. Um, whole genome sequencing was taking two to three weeks at one point for our province, not so long ago when variants were already established here. And it was it was very dangerous um, and it put us at disadvantage. Um, a central one is the issue of public buy-in. To what degree, you know, even if you put out a public health order, are people going to comply with social distancing requests, with mask use requests, with uh, to go and, and self-isolate uh, following exposure, to get vaccinated? These are all issues on which the the uh, stability of our healthcare system depends, yet they are things that are um, frustratingly outside of our direct control. Uh, and you know, something as basic as mask use, as you folks are aware, still has um, you know, really been um, under, underutilized by uh, many areas of the province, most notably in, in rural regions. Um, 
there were uh, additional limits associated with sequencing, our ability to get back understanding of variants, information technology, et cetera. In some communities, there were other issues, for example, needing to live with, given the unique roles the schools play in the North, making sure that we, we lived within the constraint of keeping schools open. What could we do to make the community safe while keeping schools open? That was presented to us as a challenge. Um, and we were dealing with countless uncertainties. These uncertainties evolved a lot. Um, early on, there were you know, a lot of questions about how does this bug spread? To what degree, in the earliest form, does it need um, an animal vector? Does it, you know, does it spread person to person in the earliest days? Or is it foodborne spread due to exposure to, you know, uh, pangolins and bats as, as food? Um, uh, but uh, even to this day, there's a lot of a fair bit of uncertainty about the exact contribution, for example, of, of surface-based transmission. Is it really, really low, almost zero, or is it moderately low or, or something above that? Um, uh, airborne has emerged as the clearest uh, route to most transmission, but fecal-oral transmission still seems possible. There's, an un there's a huge number of cases that have been associated with food serving that suggests that maybe, you know, contamination on the food can also uh, infect. Um, so a, a huge number of different uncertainties I don't have time to go into. Um, some of the most important ones were about, you know, who actually has COVID. And there's for a very long time, and I'd say the better part of a year, a holdout set of, of parties that believe that COVID-19 is predominantly spread by people with symptoms. And the evidence has pushed against that. Uh, particularly for young people, um, overwhelmingly, they do not have overt symptoms. Uh, and even among older individuals, um, there's a large fraction often who, who won't carry symptoms, like a third, but can spread it and, and, and can shed it in, in quite some amount. And those are in some sense the most deadly because they won't know to present for testing they won't be fought except through found except through active case finding, and there was a lot of uncertainty about, um, you know, what was the case there, and and that shapes testing strategies. It shapes, you know, whether you're depending on temperature screening and reports of symptoms to to, you know, prevent people from going into work. It's it's a it's widely believed that a very large fraction is now from asymptomatic or oligo or pausy symptomatic people. People who barely know they're sick. Uh, they don't really consider themselves to have serious symptoms. Maybe it's snow mold or allergy or what have you. Um, so we had to confront a huge number of uncertainties that were profound in the first case. Um, having covered you know, some basic aspects of how models were used and, and for whom they were used, I'd like to now give a glimpse of different lines of modeling. And I'm going to start with the very earliest, um, which was used for informing the health system. And, and this was created um, by my hand, predominantly, um, on my desk. Uh, but um, there was a parallel model that my student, my doctoral student, Yuan Tian, also created, uh, which, um, which led to some thinking about how to evolve and unify both models. So um, this was based on compartmental modeling. For those familiar with system science, it was uh, system dynamics modeling. And um, this was kind of a uh, elaboration of classic forms there, SEIR models, um, with six, uh, successive compartments uh, with some distinctions here that are specific to, uh, to this bug. Um, and uh, particularly, we had an asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic shedding phase, which um, was posited to, to have a high degree of shedding prior to development of symptomaticity. But what we did not hear is have a, a sort of separate line of people who are persistently pausy symptomatic or oligosymptomatic, which seems to indeed be a, a closer match to reality as it, as it turns out. Um, so this system mapped out these needs all the way through to levels of ICU use. We totaled up ICU needs, hospitalization needs without ICU, 
uh, contact tracing, impact of screening, a uh, whole set of factors. And, and these models were used to kind of give some feel for you know, how different types of interventions affect things. Um, as uh, Richard Hamming said, um, the purpose of computing, in my view, is insight, not numbers. And these models, you know, were designed to, to, given the huge uncertainties we had at the time, we were operating a lot off of data from Italy and, and uh, other jurisdictions, Wuhan, China. Um, we were just trying to get a broad brush sense of, you know, how might interventions affect things. And for example, a 5% mixing reduction could go from blue to red here. And the key point is, look, it delays the peak and it lowers it by a lot more than 5%. So these are some takeaways that are very new to people in the health system um, who might be inclined to think linearly and, and wouldn't expect that it's gonna affect the timing of the peak. Um, or you know, uh, how does um, the timing of an intervention affect the, um, uh, the, the, the timing of the peak. And it turns out intervening earlier pushes the peak back, for example. Might be obvious for those who have gotten involved in some modeling at some point in your life, but it was most certainly not obvious to health system colleagues. Or, you know, this issue of the old uh, bugaboo um, of associated with case importation, you know, we got to close the borders, close the borders to avoid being swamped by people coming into a province with the bug. Well, um, it turns out that that can help early on defer things, but it's not going to help reduce the size of the outbreak that ensues. Eventually, someone's going to get in who doesn't have symptoms or tested negative, but, but you know, uh, that's just because they're in such an early stage of infection. And the outbreak's going to come. It's just, it buys us time. And um, there was a lot of populist ideas, you know, shut the borders, keep out people from country X, that that's going to somehow, you know, insulate ourselves from risk. This was, you know, before um, the U.S. administration was talking about ingesting, you know, injecting bleach and so on, but it was still a lot of xenophobic content. And one of the things we dispensed with was the idea that we can, you know, close the borders and keep keep everyone out at such a level that we're going to avoid an outbreak. Um, this work was um, built by myself together with UN Tian and was really designed to, to inform things in March, you know, within a week of my secondment, just getting something in front of people to dialogue and talk about the implications. These models within Within hours of presenting the first big results from this modeling, the province decided to do the full deal shutdown, which had been very they had been very hesitant to do. Uh, I, I truly believe, and I, I'm informed by by those in the know that the modeling was, you know, a very big reason they decided to, you know, to tighten up dramatically in a way that really put us in good stead as a province uh, early on. Um, the next line of modeling that we engaged in was um, useful for the next round of um, capacity planning. This modeling gave some rough capacity planning estimates, but uh, I knew we needed something more, a lot better than that, something that included things like um, chronic disease representation, representation of greater risks in certain areas of the province, um, different demographics uh, and age structure. Um, you know, something quick, quick and, and getting something in front of us can build intuitions, but I didn't want to hang our capacity planning estimates with tens of millions of dollars and potentially more hanging on this. And so my student, Yuan Tian, um, uh, created a, a very innovative model here, um, which is a hybrid model, which basically combines um, uh, aggregate modeling for most of the population with individual level modeling for, for particular individuals at a certain level of risk, in this case, uh, who are infected, um, and capture their care trajectories once infected through the healthcare system. And so we had age, sex, and, and some risk factors associated with this. Um, and UN worked on chronic disease, and I believe smoking as risk factors. Um, and and age certainly is an overwhelming one. And this gave me 
um, greater confidence because there's such disparities on the health side, of course, that we knew about very early on for uh, those um, in terms of how they progress clinically and the degree to which they need hospital care, ICU care, so severe and critical level patients as compared to patients with the most mild of symptoms. Um, and there was this nagging issue about asymptomatic patients or oligosymptomatic patients that would yet be resolved over the course of a couple of months to really sort out. So in this case, we have this kind of upstream model. Um, apologies for its, uh, its appearance, but um, what it lacks in aesthetics, it makes up for in utility. Um, and people from this model would flow into and become, they'd bud off and become a person when they got infected and they become people in different, uh, with, with fulsome characteristics and a face upon the world in which to circulate. And, and having that face, they could then circulate into healthcare systems. And UN drew on a long experience uh, for years working in the Health Quality Council where she had modeled the province's six major hospitals um, and uh, contributed to the shaping of some of the designs of some of those hospitals. Um, uh, and based on that experience, she put into place, you know, a, uh, a rough abstract sort of representation of, of hospital flow that captured some of the care delivery needs and the demand for ICU beds, acute care beds and ventilators at an individual level. So here, most of the province was represented just as counts of people in different stat statuses, stati, but, um, but then they turned into agents and were followed at an individual level. And as I recall, remained as agents. Um, so UN is responsible for this. And this provided the province with some much better numbers for what to expect. And in fact, regional numbers for what to expect because she did have a regional uh, a model that, that would uh, correspond to different regions and uh, could be used to characterize the demographic um, differences throughout Saskatchewan and the, uh, the differences in, in uh, things like chronic disease uh, prevalence. Mind you, this would have been around June, I think, maybe July, um, which is just remarkable. Um, what this team accomplished in the past year within four months, I would have thought would have taken two years a lot of the time. And UN was up there, you know, working really, really hard to deliver this in the face of a, of a very rapidly changing professional situation. So I've got to credit her for that. A third line of modeling um, is one that um, it continues to this day. And this is uh, also an individual based model. Um, it was a model that started, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, in, in February of 2020, long before, weeks and weeks before, perhaps even a, close to a month before the, um, uh, the first cases came up in Saskatchewan. The first was uh, March 12th, I think, a presumptive case. And about a month before the snowmobile rally and the bond spiel, that caused untold levels of grief uh, for the province. Um, uh, a bunch field that attracted medical doctors to Edmonton and many of whom came back and transmitted uh, COVID uh, within our province, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, and in this model, um, it was built early and it's evolved in a remarkable way. And it's a testimony to its incredible engineering that went into it. Uh, this is a model that uh, is GIS based. Uh, so it's based on a geographic representation of the province. Um, originally it was focused on one community, although in a GIS type fashion, which I wanted for stakeholder communication and for flexibility. Um, uh, it supports really fine grained public health interventions um, and you know a, a very heterogeneous uh, sort of depiction of the population that can scale very well. Um, uh, this model has been used uh, quite extensively by those outside the province as well as in. It's uh, arguably our foremost workhorse model within the province to this day. Um, 
Uh, it is recalibrated periodically and used for frontline advice and meetings with the chief medical officer on a weekly basis um, with each successive week. Um, but it's also been uh, quite extensively used by collaborators with the Australia Capital Territory, the Yukon Territory. And, and just recently, uh, we had for a long time informal collaborations with Alberta Health Services through uh, Deputy MHO there. And recently that's been formalized uh, with some um, funding for looking at herd immunity issues in a way that loops in Alberta Ministry of Health, et cetera. So this model was also like the last one, highly innovative. Um, uh, the only model that wasn't innovative was the one I built. Uh, I figured out someone's got to take the hit. And so I, I built a boring model um, just to get us off the ground. That was a booster rocket that fell back and this model and UN's model for uh, hybrid, hybrid models took over with a, uh, with a much more innovative combination of methods. And, and this one combined agent-based modeling with discrete event simulation. So we have each, these days we have each community in the province, demographics for each community, and communities are represented as agents, which allows looking within the community at the households, the long-term care facilities, the workplaces, the acute care facilities, uh, in some cases, homeless shelters, we've used this, uh, and in other facilities that uh, bear note as transmission venues. This model saw a huge use both in an urban setting and in La Loche Clearwater in our indigenous areas in the North. Um, uh, in a way that fundamentally um, helped inform, and in some cases uh, really helped guide some of the intervention work that went on there. An excellent back and forth with MHOs on a very frequent basis who are on the ground and working with community. And it's really in that context that a lot of the knowledge translation from it, health communication came about. Now, I'm pleased to say that from the start, in that very first conversation with Jenny Basran going up and down to Regina on February 28th, um, 2020, um, as the drum beats of, um, of COVID-19 were getting louder and the first deaths that occurred in, in Korea and Italy, and I knew we were living a borrowed ton, um, we, we recognized special vulnerabilities. We recognized the issue here is not that broad depiction of an undifferentiated population like you see here. Um, it's uh, not even sort of a matter of just regionally stratifying it. We need something finer grained than that. We need something that takes into account the unique vulnerabilities of different groups that extend beyond age. They, they have to do with place, they have to do with housing, they have to do with geography, uh, they have to do with uh, institutionalization, et cetera. Um, and uh, I remember saying, um, you later quoted it back to me that look, um, to my team, our models will be judged not on their accuracy, but on their ability to inform the protection for our province's most vulnerable. And I believe that uh, strongly to this day. It's, it's really, um, you know, that is our foremost challenge here. And that's the one that often gets glossed over with modeling studies. So we really wanted models that would allow us to understand that the real texture of issues to intervene in remote and rural communities, including in indigenous communities. Seniors, not only as a demographic group, but those specifically in things like long-term care and to inform um, appropriate um, testing and and vaccination strategies and strategies for limiting visitors or welcoming visitors in light of the loneliness that comes up in those facilities. Um, you know, dealing with PPE needs in those facilities and in acute care, et cetera. Um, so whether it was incarcerated populations or those with chronic disease or, or rural communities or indigenous communities, we wanted to be at the front line to be able to inform things and not be able to say, oh, well, you know, we can't. We can't talk about that because we're just dealing with rolled up numbers for this entire population group. So this model was built with those needs in mind and it was built extraordinarily well in ways that one can't even believe how solidly by one Wade McDonald, who's, who I see is, is with us this afternoon. Um, 
And uh, this model has come to incorporate a variety of, of um, agents that speak to these different categories. Um, many of them are, are heterogeneous uh, persons, but we also have agents for things like schools and hospitals and colonies and, and laboratories and long-term care facilities, which have processes associated with them that need to be simulated. Um, and in some cases we've applied it like in the Lodge Clearwater to homeless shelters. Um, we also have some agents which are more passive. I'm speak, since I'm speaking to a computer science audience, I'll talk a little bit more about the kind of nuts and bolts here. Um, but things like workplaces and, and, and households uh, are also represented. And even things like test specimens kind of go through as a token that's kind of represented as an agent. Um, there's one of the, the big goals here was to have a model that would inform an understanding of the, the really diverse type of, of mixing contexts which um, uh, exist out there in the world. And so we wanted a model that would allow us to reason about you know, transmission in the home. If, if people are asked to isolate um, you know, once they get a COVID-19 test, how is that gonna play out if they're at home with you know, five other family members or in La Lache Clearwater where they might have 14 other people, not, uh, not unusually within their house, um, within a three bedroom home. Um, how would it play out in the context of an incarcerated population? How would it play out in the context of a long-term care facility? Um, th these are you know, very, very real issues. And so we wanted to represent these different venues, these different places where people mix for their unique characteristics. Um, and uh, we sought to do so by, by really you know, paying attention to those. Some of them turn rather specialized, like for our northern ones where, you know, there are quite a few community members who have to go via medical taxi for three hours to get dialysis or four hours uh, each way and then drive back with a medical taxi driver. There were cases of transmission within the taxi and uh, for people who, because their immune system was damaged by chronic disease, be very vulnerable. And our sponsors wanted to know about that and, and you know, homeless shelters and, and the clinics, the dialysis clinics themselves with all these very vulnerable people concentrated. How, what are the risks there that it may disseminate, come from one community and disseminate to many? Um, so we sought to have a model to be worthy of this uh, diversity. Um, now this model over time was successfully elaborated. And you know, these days it has multiple variant types, B117 and P1 recently, um, age-based mixing and age-based virulence and transmittivity and daily exposure patterns, um, uh, inter and inter-community mixing between communities, people going from farmers markets on colonies to off colony. Um, differences in mask use, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, testing that goes on, um, you know, context specific case importation needs that we explored and homeless shelters, et cetera, that I had mentioned and household distributions. And there's a lot of healthcare elements that were represented here, whether it's care seeking or care pathways, um, PPE use, delays, visitors to facilities, testing for healthcare workers, you know, we could put in a lot. Um, uh, so agents within the small person agents, I should say, were represented in a way that, you know, captured aspects of their situation. Are they undiagnosed or diagnosed with COVID if they are infected? Um, they had a rather articulated progression of their natural history with COVID, which could stay persistently asymptomatic or oligo symptomatic. Or, or turn into something symptomatic, in which case it has different levels of severity. Um, if palsy symptomatic, they might not be uh, discovered, um, might remain in that state for a long time. What's their vaccination status? This has been elaborated uh, to, to, um, to take into account multiple lines of vaccination at some level. We, uh, people can get, um, can get uh, vaccinated with, with different uh, AZD, the AstraZeneca or the uh, Pfizer, um, an RNA vaccine um, and different levels of care need and so on. And we had this underlying latent construct of risk attitude as to how it affected things like mask use 
and for the same person gatherings, their participation gatherings, and they're likely to have working from home. Um, unfortunately, we don't have vaccination tied in with that risk attitude yet. I'm kind of pushing to get that in there um, because there does seem to be a very useful uh, instrumental variable associated with, with risk attitude. It cuts across multiple areas. If someone's blasé about COVID-19, they're gonna be blasé about mask use, about mixing, and quite likely about vaccination. They're less likely to get vaccinated. I'll put it that way. Um, and we can capture that with that latent construct. Hospitals were represented at kind of a rough level, a little bit like uh, UN's model, but in a way that, that allowed for um, capturing a lot of these, uh, these essential pe uh, factors of people waiting and potentially infecting people while in the hospital, infecting uh, care workers or being infected by care workers or by other waiting individuals, et cetera. So these are flow charts in what's called discrete event simulation, which capture cues of people waiting and waiting for beds and um, waiting for ventilators, uh, et cetera. We also had similar processes for things like labs and contact tracing um, to capture the delays associated with them and questions and try to address questions we were getting on capacity, like what sort of capacity do we need to keep up with things. Um, so, you know, a model like this was designed to inform fine grain interventions. What do we need to do on the ground to stop this bug in the lush clear water or stop the bug on the colonies or, or you know, deal with the outbreak in Regina that occurred with variants about six weeks ago. You know, what's our best bang for the buck? Geographically, maybe we intervene in a certain way under geographic sphere. How can we, how can we get the biggest bang for a buck? How can we get the quickest gains or the biggest gains? That's what this model's, you know, really call to, to service is, 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 was, was designed for. And we, we had a huge number of different things in there. From the earliest get-go, inspired by what went on in, in China, where they had these uh, community uh, hospitals, um, we had community cohort facilities that allowed people who were infected, instead of staying home with their families, which caused big transmission in Wuhan, to put them instead in these cohorting facilities with other infected people and under supervision of medical experts who could recognize when they need oxygen and need to get in. Um, that, that is something which was deployed and used our representation in our north, but has been underutilized elsewhere in the province. Um, uh, so, you know, door to door screening was represented uh, for some um, specialized needs, long term care measures, closing facilities to visitors. How much does it help? How about staff sharing between different facilities, PPE use, um, you know, uh, different mask use in different contexts? Um, uh, you know, are masks really needed in the home or, or needed in school or what have you? So, you know, early on, this is actually from, I think, March of last year. To give you a sense of, maybe, maybe it was April. Um, this is, uh, uh, I think, 2024. 20, in any case, uh, yeah, scenario 24. Maybe it's late April. Um, to give a sense, though, of how quickly Wade worked, I mean, he started this model, and, and this is an extremely sophisticated model, um, but he got it up and running, and it was producing results. So we would run these results over many, an ensemble of realizations, because each run was uncertain. It would have stochastics. You know, did this person, when they happened to be in contact with that other one when they were waiting in the, in the emergency department, did, they, did the first one catch it from the second one? Or... Or did that uh, person transmit it when they brought it into the long-term care facility, the staff member? So we would run this many, many times for sort of a baseline case and an intervention case and evaluate, okay, if we close schools to September, we had no long-term care visitors, you know, we had 90% workplace closure to, to September and community cohorting and PPE use at, at a really high level. How would that change things? How would it change deaths? Or how would it change long-term care infections? And you can see some of the results coming out of this model. And you see that it, it not only changes the, um, the, the magnitude, like bringing estimated number of deaths down quite a lot, but changes the timing of it. And 
the nature of the distribution, you know, how tightly concentrated is around zero, for example, versus up in this bar. And a, a huge number of these runs were done. I mean, Wade is just unbelievable for running these things. And I don't know how he did it. Um, there, there's three people, I don't know how in the world they, they handled the past year. Um, there's actually a fourth person, but uh, he's busy talking right now. So, um, but the, the third, the three other people, Wade is one of them. And um, Wade ran a huge number by April. We, we had a huge number of these different scenarios differing with all sorts of different specifics of what's closed, what's open, what level of care undertaken um, to really uh, you know, get a, a broad overall view of what interventions make the most difference, what would prevent a fall surge. You could see we, we pretty well thought there's likely to be a fall surge in infections and the rough timing from October to November rings exactly true. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the province didn't really fully make use of this. Uh, a huge amount of effort went into it, and they kind of looked at it and said, that, that's nice, but, but it's scary. Like, it's too busy. I don't, I don't want to look at it. Um, there's too much information there. I don't know what to do. And, and they didn't make full use of it, um, which is a real shame, because there's a huge amount of insights here that, that came out of trying these things. And we recognize particular factors that are like the essential ones and others that are nice to have and that just tweak it a little bit. Um, um, a lot of that, unfortunately, was not fully captured in, um, in health system understanding. Um, we would also do a lot of you know, studies like within particular communities, like, OK, if we put in place community cohorting a little lush clear water, um, and we layered on top of it school closure, we layered on top of it social distancing or mask use, how much would that make a difference? And for example, mask use alone made a huge difference, it, our results showed. And this is part and parcel of motivating the community to adopt masks, which they did in on mass and highly successfully and drove this bug into the ground. And um, I credit Wade for being a large part of the reason the lush clear water situation turned so dramatically after so many trying weeks. Um, another thing we, we did with this model was, and, and this was a bit later, um, was to try to motivate basic understanding. You know, we, we realized early on, this is great for geeks like me. This is great for sort of, you know, gearheads who, who, who love going in and, and looking at a set of possibilities and weeding through them for the, the nuggets. And it's great, uh, I thought, if we boiled down that nugget for them and presented them together with this, but it was just overwhelming. Um, so a lot of what we ended up using later on were kind of, um, kind of uh, Aesop's fables type of thing, you know, like, like you would teach uh, general principles in a very stylized fashion using results from this, you know, um, um, this impeccably evidenced and, and rich and rigorous model. Um, and you would use it to teach take home points that were much simpler. Um, an example would be this, you know, you, you have periods of tightening. Um, this was from the fall. This is an example, I'm, I'm not encumbered on this one to not be able to show it to people. Um, there's a lot of stuff I, I can't, can't show uh, openly, but, but with this tightening thing, for example, we posited, okay, suppose, suppose you know, as cases rise, um, we were to tighten up. Um, and uh, what would be the effect of the tightening? Put aside numbers and so on. Just, you know, we have rising cases, we put in place a tightening regime where we have a lockdown or we have a, you know, schools remain open. I think this one was schools remain open, but, you know, um, most people work from home, 75% of people work from home and, and we have, um, you know, no gatherings above size five or whatever. We, we could, you know, parameterize that. What would the impact be? And you, you, you kind of see a turnaround here and it brings it down within a span of about three, three weeks. Um, so, so that was, you know, reassuring to people. But then you start looking at, um, things like uh, the acute care utilization. This is for hospital admissions. And you start to see, well, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? We put in place this tightening 
and we're expecting the goodies, right? We're expecting it to turn around. Um, we're seeing these hospital numbers go, go up and that's often what motivates the tightening right now. The hospital numbers are going up, so let's tighten. Okay, we tighten, but this peak occurs, it's like two weeks in. So it's gonna still carry this momentum like a freight train, it's going forward and you're tightening or not, you're not gonna stop it from spiking into this region where you're going beyond field hospital capacity, um, which is not where you wanna be. Now you look at ICU admissions and census, which is even more downstream. And you know, by the time you tighten, you're going through the roof after that. Um, and because it has such momentum, this is like um, at the end of the bull whip, it's, it's going um, and you may start moving the front of the whip back, but it's gonna flick up and uh, at great cost in terms of exceeding ventilator capacity or the number of staff who can train staff teams to staff those ventilators, which was more of an issue. And by the time you get out of lockdown, you've barely reduced ICU to below what it was when you entered. And in some of our runs, ICU might've been ahead, uh, you know, above what it was when you entered the lockdown. So you think you're gonna turn the situation around, drain the ICU, be back to normal in three weeks, and you're fooling yourself. This is a fool's errand. You know, you've gotta stay under lockdown for a lot longer if you're gonna be this late in delaying, because you're gonna be picking up those pieces from going at really high levels of ICU for some time. And if you were barely breathing uh, as a care system when you're going into the tightening and you think it's gonna give immediate relief, you're gonna be fooling yourself because when you come out, you're gonna be also in an equally desperate state. This is a big lesson in terms of momentum. And a lot of things with this model, we ended up trying to boil down. And I have to credit Kurt um, for taking you know, the lead on this and so many other things uh, at, at starting in late summer uh, when Wade was called away um, for, for putting together an interactive tool, which would allow you to kind of interactively explore um, you know, if, if I had this parameter, that parameter, that parameter, to what degree am I likely to exceed? What's the probability I'll exceed this capacity limit or that one, or I'll, I'll be above, um, you know, the admissions target I'm looking at. So this model really came out of Wade's leadership and later Kurt uh, Kruger took it over um, in his capacity as a uh, consultant and working with our, our lab and working alongside Wade as kind of uh, team team players once Wade returned in, in October. Uh, also contributing were, um, were here Alex Dumay and uh, Bryce Keeler, um, who made notable contributions during the time of the Lush Clearwater outbreak. And I have to credit Winshul Chen and uh, Chin Yang for um, their contributions to a parallel ABM model, which gave some really significant insights early on about the potential roles technology would play in, in uh, assisting contact tracing. They did some amazing work with behavioral grounded models, but um, we, uh, because of other needs for their education, we needed to, to scale back on things. Um, like most models, that was a booster rocket that got us to a certain height, but ended up needing to, to fall away for the next phase. Um, the next, line of work uh, though was uh, spatially explicit modeling. This was a smaller line of work sponsored out of uh, questions from our chief medical officer about gatherings. You know, we were asked, you know, what, what gathering size is safe uh, for our province? Uh, what bubble size or, um, you know, is it okay if we have, um, you know, 10 people at a gathering? Um, uh, compared to two gatherings of size five, um, which is more dangerous. You know, they were grappling with these issues of gatherings and didn't have a lot to go by other than kind of, well, we, we hear that Alberta had something like that or, or Ontario is something like this. Um, and PHEC got wind of our interest in this and got really interested because they didn't know of any objective guidance, the Public Health Agency of Canada. So they turned to us actually to, to further sponsor us and, and underwrite work um, with an extra budget for informing an understanding of gathering risks. And this took into account 
not just size, which is the obvious thing that public health orders try to regulate, but frequency of gatherings, composition, you know, is it the same meeting of the knitting club every week, the same exact people? Um, or is it, you know, different people meeting up at a, at a nightclub every Friday um, and it's very entropic mixing? Um, uh, you know, what's the duration of the gathering? How if it's four hours, church service versus a one hour church service. Does that boost the risk? Um, and if so, how much? Um, how does mask use play a role into this? And how do people are fixed? How do it's final exams and everyone's at a fixed desk? Um, there's 300 people around them, but they're all separated by six feet and people are in one place for the time and they come in in an orderly way and go out. Is that low risk, high risk? Um, 300 people there, it's beyond the size threshold, but is it is it really risky? How about a stadium of Rough Riders fans? Um, uh, you know, these are the sort of questions which people couldn't answer. So we we wanted to put together some models that could answer that. And there's a lot of things which are really interesting there. If you have greater levels of mixing, for example, and a fixed duration, um, you're if you're working the crowd, you're going to meet more people in that gathering. You can spread it to, but each person you're going to be spending less time with. So if you're spreading it with aerosols, they're going to be less exposed to your aerosols on each person you meet. Whereas if you're spending your time with six people around you, um, you know, you're going to be exposing them a lot to your aerosols. So there's some non-obvious sort of trade-offs between these things. And we put together a couple types of models. Um, this was during the summer. Um, uh, we had kind of a, most of our models early on were kind of random mixing, like, we had schools and kids kind of mixed randomly in there and we had long-term cares and they kind of mixed randomly in there and homeless shelters and kind of mixed randomly in there. And, you know, kind of gave an unsettling feeling, um, especially when we got to schools. Um, so, uh, you know, we, um, we wanted to put together something more structured than that. So we put together um, first an abstract gatherings model um, where I, uh, I had to sit back and think and one Saturday at a couple hours, which, you know, I wasn't dealing with a burning, burning fire for, for some other reporting need or whatever. And, and I could think some about the necessary, dimensionally correct, necessary formulation of this. Um, and, but I, I really yearned to get to a place where we could do something that would validate this abstract gatherings model, make sure it held water and really understand how it needs to be modified in certain contexts. So we ended up on, um, you know, having this abstract gatherings model, but turning to spatially explicit models, which were designed to really test it and, um, and to inform an understanding of managing certain venues, um, uh, whether it's concerts or stadiums or grocery stores or theaters, et cetera. We wanted something that would inform that particular context. Um, because the interventions or the, the safety measures that could put into place for each of those or for you know, a, uh, a congregation in a religiously oriented setting would be rather different from gathering to gathering. Um, so we had these um, spatially explicit models where we kind of posited people having this um, exposure bubble around them. We, we wanna take it further with aerosols, but we haven't gotten that that stay in the in the air for a certain amount of time. And we ended up building these things at a specialized basis for homes, restaurants, nightclubs, stadiums, and movie theaters. And a lot of this work was done by a student whose picture unfortunately I'm lack, lacking, but uh, Zushan Ahmad, who's an undergraduate uh, working on this for a uh, 400 project. And so this was a representation of, for example, a nightclub um, where you see people uh, interacting on a dance floor and, and in the periphery. Um, there's uh, some impact of gathering duration, for example, which we could derive, um, reflecting the fact that stochastic, again, you've got to run ensembles of models and, and understand you know, how infections scale with gathering duration. This is for a restaurant, for example, and stadiums or a different context. And through this, we can really inform, you know, the particular venues. Now I have to say, for anyone interested in this sort of work, we have the ultimate challenge thrown down like a gauntlet uh, before us uh, this past Friday. 
um, if anyone gets a hankering for doing this sort of modeling, come talk with me because uh, we do have an opportunity to do this for the U of S um, and create a detailed, potentially spatially explicit model, certainly individual level model, characterizing the U of S ecosystem, dorms, classrooms, pack center, laboratories, you know, uh, far flung apartments um, and, and transit system. Um, they really would like uh, a model to inform decision making and we have the technology to do it. We need a person. Um, and if anyone's really interested in that, come talk with me. Um, uh, Cause uh, I don't have the uh, midnight hours to burn to do it myself and no one else has yet stepped forward. Um, okay, so um, next thing I want to talk about another line of work, which is uh, combines machine learning in the form of particle filtering and particle MCMC with dynamic modeling. Um, this too was launched uh, really from Massachusetts. Um, it was launched, uh, you know, in my mind, the day I took that picture of East Campus um, uh, and was grappling with the uh, AMR, the issues with antimicrobial resistance. Um, uh, my heart was there, but I, my mind was on, okay, we got to go to particle filtering and, and particle MCMC to confront this challenge of COVID-19. Um, so COVID-19 uh, work in this area includes work for the health system, government of Canada through both separately, separate contracts with Public Health Agency of Canada, where we report for all provinces of Canada in ways that uh, is circulated to provinces and within the federal government. Um, First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada as well. Um, we report to for First Nations uh, communities across all provinces, across six major provinces, I should say. Um, and what we're doing here is, is, is kind of a different tack. The ABM we saw earlier is, a, um, is, is evidence informed and periodically, like every few weeks it undergoes new calibration. And Kurt and Wade were at the forefront of getting in place infrastructure to do these calibrations on a regular basis. But what we have here is an entirely different character. It's a model that, on, that leverages machine learning to take model expectations and new data on a daily basis and bring them together for a consensus estimate. Um, so uh, we're basically taking diverse sources of data um, including things like cases and uh, ICU admissions and non-ICU admissions to hospitals and ICU census and, and uh, broader hospital census and deaths. And we're combining them with things like wastewater, um, wastewater concentration estimates where they're available like for Saskatoon. And combining that with a dynamic model that captures the structure of how COVID-19 develops in people. And the mappings between those two um, reflect um, aspects, for example, of where people shed within their history of infection. So we try to do this on a daily basis to give us a sense of what's going on under the covers right, right now, what's going on in the underlying situation, undiagnosed infected, basic reproduction, excuse me, effect, uh, effective reproductive number, force of infection, how much risk people have circulating in this community now or in the in the province as a whole, uh, recognizing changes in behavior, um, and then projecting it forward. And we have the capacity to ask some uh, rough what if questions. So the idea here, look, um, you know, even the most detailed models, you know, the met, if we had a thousand Wades and a thousand Kurtz to match them, um, spending, you know, untold hours, um, uh, you know, in, in pursuit of perfection on COVID-19 models with evidence, uh, uh, you know, across the world to inform that. A model like that is still fragile. It's not going to know the particular stochastic trajectories that happened because someone came to that snowmobile rally to serve food who was COVID-19 infected, or that chance incident occurred at the bond spiel that led to the person to come in, or that came into La Loche Clearwater uh, through a chance meeting at dialysis facility. Um, 
So stochastics are going to mean any model is going to diverge. It's a fool's errand to expect the model to be a crystal ball. Um, so the idea here is rather than expect our models to be crystal balls, um, we're going to use constant feedback for the models. And it's kind of like this. Um, uh, you know, you probably have, uh, wherever you folks are, you probably have a very good mental model, although an increasingly perhaps faded one, about how to get from where you are now to the university. You could probably walk that uh, very easily or take the, the transit system very easily despite the months that have transpired. But it would be an absolute act of madness, despite your very good mental model of how to get to the university to do so with your eyes closed. You'd get in all sorts of trouble. You'd be hit by the bus instead of taking it. You'd you know cross the road at the wrong time and and end up um, in a bad way. You'd uh, you'd end up tripping off the pavement and if you're lucky breaking your your leg um, and getting taken to the hospital before you're hit by the bus. Um, so in any of these cases, uh, what we look to do is we look to have constant feedback. We don't rely on a even a very good mental model. We, we constantly complement it with feedback from the world. And the idea here is, is the same. We, we keep the model state current with the evidence. We, we tr take the model at face value, but we know it's fallible. We take data at face value, but we know it's, va it's fallible. And we combine the two to get a consensus distributional emphasis, a probabilistic emphasis. And what we're doing here is, is not a lot different in spirit than what you look to for your weather apps, right? Um, you may be for tomorrow's weather using the same underlying model that would would have just guessed tomorrow's weather as of you know the the, the last day of, of April. But the estimate for tomorrow is a lot more accurate because that you're getting today is a lot more accurate for what the what the weather will be tomorrow to be on the uh, May 7th than it would have been if you had made that same estimate on the 31st because the weather model knows what's happened since, and it knows, well, what actually happened on the 6th today is such and such, and it could plot much better what's going to go on tomorrow. It's the same thing with these models. They're constantly regrounded in evidence. So we take evidence over time, and crudely speaking, the model learns from it. The model, we estimate the model's latent state on using the wide variety of data we have available to us. We estimate the current state, and we project forward. Um, and that's what we do day in, and that's what we do day out. And, you know, there's three techniques that are particularly useful in this regard. We make use of particle filtering and particle MCMC. I'm mostly going to speak about particle MCMC, sorry, particle filtering here. We have lots of work going on in PMCMC, which is very promising and which will probably be the source of later talks. Um, okay, so. This is a strategy we've used um, a wide variety of other places with uh, Xiao Yan Li being particularly uh, a leader in this area. Um, and the basic idea is that it's kind of like you're running your model with a thousand times in parallel. And I'm oversimplifying some things, but, but uh, hear me out on this. A thousand times in parallel, or in our case, 150,000 times in parallel. And we're running it in parallel on a stochastic model. So each element of that, um, we'll call them particles, each of those 150,000 realizations has a different understanding of what's probably the case right now. It has a different hypothesis for what's going on in the world. It has a particular number of people that thinks are susceptible, a particular number of things are exposed, a particular number of things are early stage, uh, pre-symptomatic, uh, et cetera. And each of those particles has this view about the world. And then data comes in on a daily basis. And those particles are held to account with that data. They're held up against that data and see how well they, their, their predictions of the particles of the current situation out there. It predicts how many cases we should see or how many deaths we should see or what concentration of waste we should see in wastewater. And we compare that against the actual data. And if it's found really wanting, if it's found to be a big variance, like it doesn't line up at all, that particle is, is downweighted. It's, it's punished for not performing well. And if it accords with that observed data quite well, if its likelihood function is quite high, we reward that particle with a higher weight. We, we multiply it con conceptually by a, a, 
a larger weight and uh, we update its weight with a larger coefficient. And there's this kind of survival of the fittest where those that are most um, competitive in explaining that data survive and multiply in a resampling step. And those that have very weak, very weak consistency with the data thus far tend to die out. And we do run these with standardly with 150,000 particles at a time on uh, our given COVID-19 model. So there's 150,000 different hypotheses going on about what's going on in Saskatchewan right now. And it induces a distribution for the current underlying situation that's not putting all our eggs in one basket of what's going on, but, but admits there's a joint distribution over all possibilities and some parameter, some dynamic parameters. Um, so we uh, use this for all the provinces, for First Nations in the provinces. We've used it at the local level geographies, as well as the whole province, as well as regional. Um, the underlying model is, is kind of a, kind of a, a, a descendant of that early compartmental models that, that sprung from, um, from my desk in the earliest weeks of the pandemic. Um, but it has a representation of oligosymptomatic pathways, people who never develop serious symptoms, don't even know they're sick. And as a representation of diagnosis that's, that's more fulsome uh, and hospitalization, um, uh, well, that was in the original model too. So this model is, is the underlying model. And there's a set of ordinary differential equations underneath this that are stochastic. They're stochastic differential equations. And uh, there's a lot of logic that goes into here that's really quite interesting about what drives active case finding versus passive. Finding people through contact tracing finds a lot more people, um, uh, for, for example, it can find people much more readily who are infected and not symptomatic than, than just waiting for them to walk in uh, to get tested, which they're unlikely to do. So um, we have a likelihood function, which is used for the model to judge how well a given understanding, a given particles guess as to what's going on in the world aligns with real world data. And this takes into account, you know, cases and hospital census, uh, non-ICU census and, hot, and ICU census and viral concentrations, et cetera, and uses it to update it while being, um, uh, being uh, fault tolerant. If there's no data of a certain type, like if wastewater data isn't available, it'll use it without the wastewater likelihood for that day. And so we can estimate uh, using this things like the force of infection over time for Saskatoon. Uh, we can estimate the, uh, the reproductive number, for example, um, and show its big drop uh, early on in response to public health measures. Um, uh, and a model like this has a lot of uh, texture to it, which I'll cover in a, in a future, um, future talk um, in the next, next two talks. So, uh, what does this model really give you? Well, it, it kind of gives you four things. One thing is it gives you this kind of tomographic view of what's going on in the population. Um, some of you may be familiar with um, the technological um, revolution that's occurred in going from technologies that were in place 50 years ago with, with simple linear X or simple planar X-rays to things like um, CAT scan machines these uh, computed tomography machines. These machines derive a lot of their value, um, not because anything particularly dramatically different about how they, how they use x-rays. Um, indeed, when they view you from a certain angle, your x-ray may be just as problematic. It'll be occluded by, there'll be shadows on it from you know, where a plate blocked the x-rays or where a bone did, there'll be you know, undifferentiated reasons. It has only a certain field of view and, and certain things to be overlapped, et cetera. But where this, these machines really succeed is they take these views from a, a bunch of different directions and it, they knit them together into a 3D view of the person. It's really the combining of those. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And it's kind of like this with particle filtering because particle filtering takes these different types of data, you know, these sorts of data for, of all these different things, and it knits them together into a 3D view of what's going on in the underlying system that's distributional. 
this is a particularly bad sort of view of it I, I just grabbed. But uh, I used to spend a lot of my time kind of looking at these and working to improve the, uh, the capacity of the particle filter uh, to get better predictive accuracy and better matches. But here we have um, kind of how the particle filter in, in um, blue lines up against uh, this magenta color for a wide variety of uh, particular, um, particular empirical data and lots of things we can't uh, observe empirically where we just don't have observables corresponding to it. So one thing it kind of gives you is this 3D view of what's going on in the underlying system. What's going on all across these different stocks and flows that's very rich. And it's a joint distribution over those. Um, so it may say, well, you know, some hypotheses, you know, it's very competitive to think there's a lot of of undiagnosed infectives, um, but comparatively few diagnosed ones. And there might be another <laughs> equally competitive one where lots of, of um, diagnosed ones. Undiagnosed. Is, there a, is there a concern? Again, perhaps it's not directed at me. Um, OK, so um, one is a tomographic view. Another thing is projection and, and forecasting. I'm not sure why this came up uh, again. So, so this we do daily. So whenever we produce these results, we have a map for the whole system of a distribution of how many people are in different states. And, and that allows us to project forward according to the kind of momentum of the system. We don't know exactly how much active testing and active case findings can be done. We don't know exactly how many vaccinations will be delivered in the next few days, but a lot of those things have only distal impact. So we can predict forward for you know a week or two, um, you know, with with uh, quite a lot going for it based on what we have already in place. So we we project forward, and our automated system, you know, does these projections um, uh, each day on the basis of the uh, the gains from from earlier runs, incorporating that day's data. We can also do backcasting. Here we can kind of look backwards and say, um, okay, when it was day X, we estimated what the situation of in, in that what the situation was as of day X based on data till then. But now we have the benefit of hindsight. We know an outbreak occurred just three days after day X. And that can allow us to more savvily know what was going on, what was really the case back in day three, you know, on, on day X based on what occurred later. So this backcasting is part and parcel of particle MCMC, but we've also built it into particle filtering in a way that uh, can be really nice to sort of reconstruct what went wrong, what was going on, what did we miss at that earlier time um, when we were looking at and interpreting the situation. Finally, we can ask what if questions. I, I don't have uh, slides to show this. This has been less heavily utilized because our ABM model focuses on the what ifs. Um, at a more granular level. But uh, we have been known to say, what if we could do more screening in this model? What if we could uh, put in place uh, more uh, you know, uh, contact tracing capacity or what have you? Um, OK, um, now, I, for us as computer scientists, um, I want to, I, I, I need to give credit where credit is due. Because um, you know, if I were talking to a health audience, um, I, uh, I might not talk about this as, in as fulsome a way as I will now, but um, there's a wonderful infrastructure story to be had here. And uh, Lujie Duan um, is to credit for most of that story with some significant help from uh, a couple others, Eric Redekop, uh, Aaron Todorash, and uh, from uh, Jason Gerritsen. Um, but uh, Lugia uh, built an incredible system for, for allowing these sort of daily runs to take place in an incredibly sophisticated, automated way that distinguishes the different types of runs, incremental runs from projection runs, from in, uh, intervention runs, um, that supports this daily ingesting and pre-processing and, and uh, supports distributed computation of these runs, 
post-processing scripting, putting together reports, sending reports via email, um, the whole nine yards, uh, Ruji is doing. And the things that I was doing by hand from this very seat uh, in early summer last year um, are now made incredibly easy through Lugia's disposition. I mean, he is what he has left us is nothing short of remarkable and world leading. I don't know of any system like this in the world. And it is incredibly functional, rich, extensible, and sophisticated. And uh, these days it checks for errors in the data, checks for consistency of the data that more aggregated sources align with less aggregated ones, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we take data, we ingest data from a variety of sources. Um, this typically has to be done remotely uh, by a person because there's no APIs that allow us to do that, unfortunately. Um, this is a real shortcoming of working with the health systems involved. And we put them into uh, to, to data, data files or data sources or data uh, repositories and then run them through these particle filtering algorithms which, which then produce reports. Um, and this is done on remote servers, which are maintained in a way that's uh, very sophisticated. And Luja have put together this system, and I cannot tell you, um, you know, the level of effort he had to put in. And quite a few meetings, I remember meeting with him and Xiao Yan past midnight, sometimes as late as 2 a.m., working on this system and you know aligning the model with the system in the middle and the dog days of last summer um and what's been built now is world leading and uh, nothing short of remarkable and um it, it puts us just in a an, un, an unparalleled position to deliver value for these clients who have come to the table in large part because of that it's because of this infrastructure as much as it is because of our models the, the, this infrastructure together with machine learning are like a marriage in heaven. And Lugia is the key contributor. Jason uh, contributed as well. Xiao Yan is the master of the particle filter model and she and I built that up together and she has done incredible amounts of work. Lugia and Xiao Yan are two people, I have no idea how they achieved what they've achieved in the past year. Um, it is just simply, simply astounding, and they are heroes for our province and for our country. Um, uh, Jeremy Ung has been working to advance this for Particle MCMC uh, with great effect and running it on GPUs, um, and I'm, I am grateful for the support of the department. Um, we uh, took the gaming uh, GPU machines, which were sitting in S386, and used them for what I believe is a far more noble purpose. Um, so they are now run, running COVID-19 <laughs> particle filtering, particle MCMC runs um, for our province and showing some wonderful scientific results on the efficacy of particle MCMC. Luce, again, is the leader there. He, his thesis work has shown how you can speed uh, these types of computations up with particle MC by dozens of times. Things like 50 times are not unusual with large models and things above a hundred times speed up with GPUs and the right speed up are possible. So Lugia is, is you know, the infrastructural God who has, who has bestowed upon us this bounty. And it's unbelievably, um, unbelievably enabling what, what he's given us. Um, now, uh, since the fall, um, I have been assisted by a set of other people because there was a time where daily I was running about four hours of my day, two to four hours of my day were just used for generating reports. And it was just time to make the donuts every day. And that's what I called it. it was every day it was time to make the donuts after I woke up and I'd go down and for two hours I would send in reports to Jenny Basran, which would be circulated to hundreds of people throughout our health system. Um, Fortunately, since the fall, I've been joined by some extraordinary undergrads who also deserve, deserve kudos. Uh, Aaron Todorash, uh, Eric Redekop, and Vion Patel have really advanced the system and built atop what uh, Luce, you know, the, the incredible foundation Luce put into place. Okay, so that's a kind of tour of our technologies. 
spatially explicit models, early compartmental models, ABM models for fine grain intervention analysis, particle filtering models and particle MCMC models to ingest data daily for all sorts of different jurisdictions. Um, a whole, whole grab bag of, of different um, models for different needs, which have contributed all of them to an understanding for health system, um, health system decision making. Um, what broad reflections do I have coming out of this work? Um, well, the, the reflections are substantial, um, and I'm watching the time here. Um, so success breeds complacency. We saw that in a big way in our province. Um, and uh, equally uh, strongly, it's hard to get credit for preventing fires that never happen. If you prevent fires, uh, rather than being the hero that rushes into the fire and puts them out, where people recognize how big a danger fires are, if you prevent them, people don't recognize how flammable things are, what danger they're in, um, just how necessary the preventive measures are, because they've never seen a fire. And um, we saw that pretty badly in this province as a result of swift model-inspired action by our province early on. Um, and I think there was a lot of willful, um, wishful thinking that was going on in the fall that somehow we're different. We're a bunch of farmers and homesteads that have very little contact and coronavirus will never get established here. And for a long time, there was a thought the variants would never here, come here because you know, why would they come to Saskatchewan? Um, uh, they're here, they're spreading like crazy, and we were not in a good position, um, but it was not because of models that um, were wanting. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the time frame uh, for which you're planning has a huge impact on your decision making. If you're planning for 30 days, if all you care about is 30 days, you're going to be making decisions that are reflective of that. Um, and um, that that can lead to decisions which otherwise are, um, you know, astounding for their um, for for not taking into account uh, broad trends. Um, we were not in a position to dictate the uh, the time frame that people con considered significant for this work. Um, there's diverse actors throughout the healthcare system and the government, um, and the sphere of COVID-19 is a political one as much as it is an economic one, as much as it is a health one, as much as it is a social services one. And um, the, um, those consuming the models on the health side, uh, while increasingly supportive of the modeling, were in a negotiating context with those who um, you know, had other uh, goals. Uh, in mind and had other constituencies and concerns foremost. Um, uh, and uh, weren't necessarily at the table for the results. Um, uh, you know, advanced analytics to support planning and decision making, such as we've shown here, are much needed, but they're rarely appreciated up front. And there's the risk of being a bit of a profit in your own land here. And uh, we live this through. And, and so I, uh, to, to address this, I thought I'd mentioned some things I find point of emphasis. It's look, models are proper, properly used, models are thinking tools. They're not crystal balls. And most people we engaged with early on, I think conceptualize the models of crystal ball. It's gonna tell me what's gonna happen or it's useless. And um, that's not what models are best suited for. They're suited for, it's, it's not so much that they know what is right or that um, they're always gonna be correct, it's that by using them, we can more quickly spot our own um, problems in our thinking, more quickly root out things in our thinking that are off base, more quickly discover inconsistencies between what we think is the case and what the evidence suggests. And they're tools for debugging our thinking. And this is not predominantly how people welcome models, those who did welcome them, which was not universal. Um, you know, the foremost value here lies not in the models, but in the model lane. Um, it's the process of modeling, which requires marshalling the evidence and dealing with inconsistent evidence and inconsistent definitions and talking about what you're trying to accomplish, um, what the time frame is, et cetera, that, that is often um, where the biggest insights come. Um, you know, so much of what we encountered within the health system was early on a focus on the observables. It's what you see. It's, what's right ahead of me. It's 
It's what's in front of me. It's what's published in the papers and might embarrass me. Um, but, you know, as Tom showed, and as our early warning showed, that evidence from the world, whether it's in cases or whether it's in deaths or what have you, um, can be very in, ambiguous and, and interpreted. You can have more cases because you have a crisis situation and you're, you're spiraling on a controller, you can have more cases because you're really successful in finding people who are sick. Um, and there's a big difference between the implications there. And when people look only at cases and say the cases are low, so we're in good situation, they're cruising for bruising. They're, they're in, in a bad shape. Um, one of the most pernicious uh, problems we encountered was a knee-jerk reaction. And I say that not in a disparaging way. It's just it was a, it was so built in that it was you, you could it was very hard to head off once once you mentioned something that you know tightening, like moving to tighten sooner, people automatically thought that means you're going to punish the economy. It means you're going to squeeze out business owners. It means you're going to you're going to be harsher on the economy by by shutting things down. And you're, you're going to put Saskatchewan in a bad way on the economic zone. Um, and we've got to trade that off with the health side. And the idea is, you know, hold off just some more to help the economics of it, help, help business owners be less punished, help the restaurant owners who are struggling. And, you know, I get that tension, but there's a fallacy there. Um, often tightening sooner means you tighten for less long. Um, Deferring the tightening often means you're picking up the pieces for longer. You're dealing with having to stay shut for longer to bring those ICU numbers down for a long, long time. And some of our runs suggested months, you got to pick up the pieces. So if you intervene earlier, often means you open a lot earlier. Um, whereas intervening later means you're staying closed for a lot later. And that, that never really sunk in as a message, but I think it's a really important message and it gets to one of these underlying misconceptions. Um, this issue of momentum um, did carry through and, and people got the fact it's like a freight train and just wants to keep on going and we got to stop it early before it gets into that point or will you know, overrun our railroad crossing and, and hit, hit who knows how many pickup trucks. Um, um, they got the fact there are these delays which make it dangerous to close things down just based on hospital admissions. And, um, and they got the fact that models are not black boxes. Um, incredible barriers had to be overcome here. We're, we're working with a system that's stretched to its very limit. Um, people are at wit's end. Um, some of the people I was working with, you know, were, were working every bit as, as late into the night as me and needed to do so for months later. Um, uh, Jenny Basran, I, I don't know how she does it. Um, she's yet another person. I, I have no idea how she survived this past year. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that really limits um, um, what can be accomplished in terms of sometimes taking time out for, deliberate, for deliberation and so on. Um, there's just so many issues that came up as barriers uh, at the technical level as well, balkanized data, inconsistent data definitions, lack of sharing of data, you know, inconsistent address information and the laboratory system versus uh, Panorama, the system used for contact tracing that, that really complicated certain forms of analysis. Um, a constant shift from one flavor of the day to the next and leaving too little time to really because of that to really substantively investigate the actions. I think we were asked to investigate the impacts of different types of school opening about two weeks before the schools opened or something. And it was crazy because it would have taken, you know, two months, three months to pull it together at, at um, you know, just uh, full on speed. Um, real need for education to build up an understanding of dynamic modeling, understand where it comes into, what. Uh, how to appreciate it, how to use it most effectively. Um, um, uh, you know, we, we did learn the value of converting these models into services where it's regularly delivered, these reports, um, and the importance of, um, of anticipating if you're inconsistent in your results day to day, being able to speak to that. Why is it different? Turns out to be a huge issue. It's not so much that they believe the number is correct, but 
if it's different than yesterday, if it's something shows something different, they don't want to know why, 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 why is this different? And um, that's pushing us to expand our system in some ways that will put it in a better position to be able to justify why we see this different result. Was it because of this data or that data? When it's coming out of a very complex machine learning algorithm, it's not always obvious. Um, uh, on the technical side, uh, we learned you know, a huge amount. Um, you know, we need more than 100,000 particles for these things. They have to run overnight. We needed to do incremental processing, put in place very sophisticated systems to allow us to, to take each new day's data point and recent data points, which could be changing and do incremental updates based on it in this recursive way. Um, uh, so we have a lot of work underway. Joint estimation with PMCMC of parameters and latent state is one of them. And doing that at GPUs is hugely helpful, but very expensive because of today's GPU market. Um, uh, we're seeking to enrich data sources. We've started to use uh, wastewater data and um, we'd really like to get search data and Twitter data and mobility data and smartphone data in there. Um, and these were part of my dreams early on in, in January um, when I first heard about this, but uh, there, there just hasn't been, been time to, to do it. And the province uh, did decline to invest in mobility data, um, uh, even though it seemed like a, an obvious win. Um, uh, variant specific uh, modeling, we need to improve our game there. And uh, in light of booster shots and uh, vaccination, growing vaccination evidence. Um, and um, we've got some neat work going on in the applied category theory stuff that somehow Cheyenne is, is managing to really push forward applied category theory atop of all of this. Um, uh, so she, she's doing just an amazing job going back and forth between applied category theory and, um, and hacking these models in uh, any logic for particle filtering um, and expanding our reporting infrastructure. You know, COVID-19, people think we may be most of the way through the outbreaks. Well, um, and I wish I had the source for this. This has been appeared in different places and I'm still trying to track down the original source. COVID-19 will be with us for decades. And it's because of its multiple waves. It's not just waves of pathogen. That's really shown as the first wave here. It's the wave of impacts of the restrictions, the fact that people haven't been able to get in for heart conditions, for you know, kidney problems, uh, haven't been able to get into you with foot ulcers, et cetera. Uh, it's the issue of um, you know, frail individuals who are dealing with rehab issues uh, for, for, for years and years and years and their psychic trauma, socioeconomic disruption, um, terrible outcomes on the mental health and addiction side in which we're working. And uh, we're gonna be living with this for years and we are investing for years. In this system we built up from Ludia and uh, with others helping will be an incredible help uh, for many models in many different areas outside of COVID, but also in these other COVID um, sequelae. Um, what could we have improved? Um, I would have insisted on salaries two or three times higher than, than were in fact delivered for trainees. There's a lot of talk about it, but at the end of the day, students were not paid enough and they needed to be because they were working every bit as hard as me. And I particularly want to single out three in just a moment. Um, we needed funds for primary data collection and we were constantly hamstrung by not being able to get data on the key things, whether it's mask use or mobility or issues of contact patterns and their change or attitudes towards vaccination, always shortchanged. Um, we have the technologies. We have things like Ethica, which we can get into the field. And um, you know, the province, partly as a result of COVID hitting budgets was just in a position of not wanting to invest. And it's penny wise pound foolish as, I'm as far as I'm concerned, but I'm not the one signing the checks. Um, and we really needed specialized trainees to, to really take advantage of things like social media, uh, mobility data, monitoring, et cetera. Um, so look, diverse types of hybrid models can offer great value for planning for preventing and controlling COVID-19, 
we use different models for different purposes. Um, if we combine them with this service provision, this constant day-to-day -day use, it can really enable lots of extra insights. And we kind of have a poor, poor person's approximation to that with ABMs as well. Um, but it's really uh, brought to its fruition with particle filtering. Um, uh, and you know, even so, this has been a scientific process. And I would tell Jenny Bazran on some days, look, um, I'd love to give you results, but I've got to make two scientific breakthroughs before I can give you those results you want to, you want to get by next week. Okay, uh, so so like this is not just an engineering challenge. There's a lot of scientific challenges. Like I don't know if particle filtering is going to be able to handle this, or if we're going to need to go to PMCMC. We were at the forefront not only of engineering but of science, and the people who allowed us to overcome. This is a story of heroes. This is a story of 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 um, you know the, the the classic story of heroism overcoming hardship. Um, marshalling strengths in the face of adversity and pulling together in the case of a crisis against the worst odds and, and succeeding. Succeeding at a level that I don't know has been matched anywhere else in Canada. And it's due to the people who have the halos around them, well-deserved um, that we succeeded. But I specifically want to single out, and I've got to keep from weeping here, um, you know, these, these three. Um, and what they did was nothing short of remarkable. And how they did it together with the rest of the elements of their lives, uh, family obligations, you could see <laughs> one of Cheyenne's daughters there um, living up in the pre-pandemic period before the restrictions came about. Um, uh, and, and enjoying the largesse of, of fruit while it was available before delivery services. Um, Wade balancing the needs of his parents uh, and Lugia, um, you know, working against all odds to build this incredible system from the ground up. What they did is, is simply astounding. It's, it goes beyond description. And if you had asked me if I thought we could do this in two years, I would have said no. But what they've done you know, I stood the, the test of time. Um, I also have to provide acknowledgements for countless others, um, uh, those in the Health Authority, Ministry of Health, uh, PHAC, uh, for their sponsorship on many contracts now, um, uh, folks in FNIB, uh, First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada, uh, our collaborators in toxicology on the wastewater side, um, to, to, to family and dear others who have, who have really made this, uh, this work possible. Um, but first and foremost, it's to these heroes who, um, who made this all possible. And I should single out also Christine, um, <laughs> whose, whose life descended into, um, uh, you know, madness. Um, amongst other things, not being given um, access to my health authority emails for about eight months because of e-health delays, um, despite numerous pokes and, and requests. Uh, Christine was dealing with my health system life and my university life in a way that would drive the normal person batty. And I remember one day, not too long ago, where I called up Christine on the phone. I asked her how she was doing, and she and I did nothing but laugh for two or three minutes straight because things are just so wacko. Um, and uh, Christine bared with this. Um, she, she, uh, she delivered in the face of this adversity in support of this team as well. So team, thank you very much. Um, the story is not yet fully written. We are uh, making use of your contributions, but long may you rest and uh, take comfort in having save this province and countless families from untold grief. And uh, having informed, you know, all of Canada, across all provinces, across uh, the Yukon Territory, for, you know, how to, uh, to, to better manage their, uh, their pandemic crisis. Uh, what you've accomplished, um, you know, would not have been uh, possible uh, I would not have judged possible and would not have been possible without your efforts. So my uh, dearest appreciation goes out to all of you. And with those comments, 
uh, I will close this uh, presentation. And um, I'd be glad to answer any questions if people would like to put them forward. Thank you very much. Anyone? I have a question. Yeah. Um, quickly, I'll just say excellent talk and interesting trying to read between the lines. Um, now, without saying I'm pro-business, there is a point. I'm not pro-business, or not unnecessarily so, but I'm an there is obviously- I'm an entrepreneur. I'm certainly pro-business, but um, uh, so, yeah. I just, I just don't want to paint myself uh, that way. But there obviously is a point where uh, live, more lives will be lost if you don't keep certain supply chains running and, and certain enterprises running. Yeah. Um, but um, are, are, would you be care to estimate <laughs> or make a statement on how much uh, politicians just view the uh, cost of staying open as collateral damage? Um, so I... Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure I'm, I'm interpreting, I could think of two interpretations and a lot of it is, is my um, uh, age and our adult uh, state right now. But um, uh, so are you asking to what degree do they view um, uh, the, you know, if they're staying open, they view, you know, a, a health cost as, as being a, a necessary, um, uh, a necessary pain and necessary suffering, but but ultimately necessary for the thriving of the economy, or is it the reverse that, for um, you know, in light of their uh, determination to to snuff out COVID, they view the economic damage as as a needed um, sacrifice. Uh, which was, was no, it was. I was asking from the first point of view. Yeah. Well, po are politicians actually that? It seems hard to believe in a province uh, this small where the politicians hail from uh, mostly rural jurisdictions and, and work with their neighbors and, and that sort of thing. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I, I do get a sense a lot of the decisions that have been made have just been, well, some people are gonna die too, too bad. Is, you know that well, there is a cost to to keeping 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 the stores open. Uh, so you know, I I try to be try to put myself into other people's heads. I mean, amongst other people, you've got to understand something about where people are coming from if you're gonna um, you know bring them over and 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 have a, a discussion which has a chance of 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 um, you know having changed their minds and. Uh, you know, there's no question that at times um, um, I, I sensed a clash amongst my public health colleagues with with others, and 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 there were times where I myself um, was surprised by the, um, um, you know, what what seemed to be, and I, I don't want this to be taken presumptuously, but but the obstinacy or or sort of you know bullheadedness of people like. We're gonna go forward. We're gonna we're gonna keep this this open, and the only way we're going is towards greater opening. It's like there's no question. Variants be damned, you know. We're gonna open this sucker up, um, and there was a fair bit of that that did get you know wind at, at some points. There 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 definitely was that you know get with the program. We're we're opening up. This is our message. Um, that wasn't from all quarters and. You know, it's it's a disparate environment, and I work very closely with with a lot of people I'm very sympathetic with who really had to, you know, navigate these winds. Um, and I'm oversimplifying. I I think those who did want to open up, though, I I don't think it was viewing it as collateral damage. I'm I'm not inclined to view the human condition that negatively. That I like to to be that cynical that I think that they would just say, oh, what the heck, you know. It's a bunch of folks in seniors' homes who are gonna uh, who are gonna die anyway, so let them die. No, I don't believe that at all. I I think there's a there's a very real sense that 
Um, it's, it's hard to believe things you haven't seen. And, you know, th there's a sense of hopeful, hope springs eternally. Um, Tom DeMarco says, I'm, I'm going to, you know, use an example from a rather different area, but, you know, Tom DeMarco says about software estimation that traditionally the way um, a lot of software estimation was done until maybe 15 years ago was give, you know, the, the, the uh, shortest possible estimate where you can't possibly prove that it won't be done by that time. Um, and, and so it's this game of brinksmanship. It's like, well, I can't claim it'll be this because obviously it won't be that. So I'll give something just on the edge of that, which is almost always too little because um, you're almost always assuming that it's gonna be fine. And I think there's a lot of optimistic thinking. I think there's a lot of wishful thinking. Yeah. I think there's a lot of um, thinking, which is, uh, um uh you know not not in not not in touch with the evidence in which cherry picks examples from around what no why why isn't north dakota been really hard hit and you know they're really low and and we're more like north dakota than we are like ontario or or more like north dakota yeah. than we are like you know bc and and so you know let's look to them now eventually north dakota was hit terribly and much worse than saskatchewan i might add but um you know, per capita basis, a lot worse. But there was still a lot of cherry picking, I think, and a lot of sense that, oh, come on, we don't really know what's going to happen here. And, and you know, nothing's happened bad yet. It, you know, um, we had these outbreaks during the summer and they didn't catch and we're really different. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not that bad. Um, and so I think it was a lot of wishful thinking. And, and, you know, there's a lot of that that goes on in the human condition, right? There's a lot of just um, overly hopeful blinding yourself to other evidence that's inconvenient and pushing on with the with the hope that it's going to all work out in the end and that um, your business friends will be happy and, and you know, donate money. So, so maybe the political system, you said this was as much political as a health concern. Oh, and yeah. I'm thinking of that remark. Um, oh, yeah. But maybe uh, perhaps the political system of checks and balances uh, uh, work to to a reasonable end. It sounds like you're saying, or or it. Uh... I mean, I think uh, so. Many a time, I despaired a little bit. Um, I thought, oh my god, you know. Okay, we lost the war here. You know, once about as lost the war. But I have to say, um, time and again, I found that, you know, I thought the province was going to abdicate in this responsibility of that. But in the end, they did something halfway. They didn't go to full Alberta. And we see what that's ended up. Um, they didn't, yeah. you know, try to just say, what the heck, we're going to open at all costs. In the end, there was a dialogue which took place that led them back from, from the uh, rhetorical excesses that I would sometimes hear. hear. And, and time and again, it was, it was informed by the modeling. I, I actually think, so I have to say, and it's a credit to those students that we were told um, at the VP level from the, health, from the SHA, that of all the things the system has done to respond to COVID-19, they believed modeling was the most important, having this modeling capacity that our lab brought. And I think the modeling did make people who were a little bit glib um, about the prospects and saying, come on, it's a New York issue early on. Look, it's New York, we ain't New York. Um, it's an Italy issue, we aren't Italy. Um, you know, there's a lot of thinking that like that early on. And I think the modeling made people swallow and say, okay, we gotta be safe rather than sorry. And, and I think that kept on occurring at different levels. And, and it wasn't so much that they based their policies precisely on our scenarios, were that only the case. That wasn't the case um, for most cases. But there were some cases where that happened, but it was not most cases. But um, in many cases, I think they used that and that kind of led them to say, okay, look, there's some strongly strongly based evidence that we may go too far. So let's not let's not do the Alberta 
um, and and just say what the heck, you know, uh, we're opening up against all odds, um, and we like them are pro business. It, there wasn't that, and so I think our there was a checks and balances, or at least there were these feedbacks that kept on pushing back. I did sense that. And I'm probably talking too much on the political side here, okay. but but you asked an honest question, yeah. and I'll, I'll you know I'll answer it. And I had a lot of sympathy for all people that I dealt with. I, I you know I clashed with with some people a bit, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, not in a not in a transgressive way, but on a uh, you know I, I made it clear that I disagreed uh, with that, um, and I was not alone, and that was welcomed. Um, but um, I have to say that I have nothing but collegial feelings towards everyone. And I think that even those professing a different philosophical standpoint um, did so with a perspective that was not callous and not dismissive. I, I will say yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Nate. Like in my circumstance, I did run into a number of people whose employment was adversely affected. And yeah. it was pretty, pretty terrible. And, and maybe I should let some other people ask some, yeah. some questions. So I, I, I see both sides of it as well. I just wondered at the level of the, you know, the uh, provincial authorities. So yeah, thanks for your answer. Yeah, there is a real, I, I will just say, because I'm sure this is something everyone is worried about. You know, there, there is a real case to be made for needing to be very conscious about the economic costs. And frankly speaking, I don't think our models or any model that I know has really adequately dealt with that reality, the situation of, of really, you know, totaling up um, uh, the, the, the psychosocial damage, um, the, the, the damage on other conditions and so on. And, and, and there's some really big issues there. Um, but um, uh, although I, I think that's the case, there's also not clear that it's uh, either or, it's trading off one or it's the other. It's not a zero sum thing. It's not like you put your, you know, you put your points into the health side and you screw the economy or you put them into the economy side and, and all health goes to hell in a handbasket. It's not like that at all. There's these very non-obvious counterintuitive reactions where businesses do not thrive if lots of their employees are sick. Um, Dead people don't order die. a lot of things, you know, uh, via local businesses. Um, uh, you know, there's long-term losses through disability that that are shocking that can come from long COVID. And like once you total it all up, th that needs a real model to make sense of it all because it's extraordinarily complex and it's definitely not zero sum. It's definitely not just a trade-off, which is too often how it's how it's presented. Um, and, and, you know, I think sometimes that's a sleight of hand. Um, I think south of the border, there's a lot of sleight of hands in that area that went on the last administration, but I reject that dichotomy and that notion that it's, uh, it's you know, um, you just got to suck it up on the health side to let the economy thrive. That's not a prescription for, for a healthy economy. Look at Australia, look at New Zealand, and they are different. We ain't New Zealand and we ain't Australia, but their economies are thriving. The people I worked with are constantly on vacation and so on because, you know, they're really opened up. Um, they deal with things in a very surgical way and they figure out a way to make it happen. And the economy is thriving. And, you know, the, uh, the Australia um, and New Zealand example is a potent one. Um, China um, managed to snuff it out uh, very early on. Taiwan snuffed it out. Singapore, after a, it, it, it got a, you know a miss with the um, with the, uh, the the worker uh, dorms and so on, but but they they managed you know to manage this. I think it can be managed actually uh, quite well if we use the right tools. Um, and you know that's why I do modeling, but. Um, but I think it's it's not the either or simplistic uh, approach that that people sometimes portray it as as a rhetorical sleight of hand, uh, and I think it's very dangerous. Yeah, other questions.
questions on the technical side, questions on the health system side, questions on where COVID's going, um, the future I, I, of this work? Yeah. I have a question. So you mentioned Alberta, being from Alberta, I come to USAS just for, for university. Um, that, now that you mentioned, like, have you looked at the numbers for the Alberta side? How grim are, is our for, forecast? Just wondering. Um, so, so we are brought into that periodically. And in fact, Xiao Yan, I don't know how in the world she does it. She, she periodically runs particle filter numbers for Alberta. And when I say periodically, it's like once a week or something for this uh, deputy MHO. And um, we've talked about regularizing that process. Um, um, uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I, I wish I could answer that. Um, uh, the problem is that, um, you know, it, it changes over time and, and I'm not, I can't speak with confidence uh, about her latest results. I know it was bad. <laughs> I know it was a very serious situation and uh, that's not su surprising, but the real question is, you know, how soon it's this momentum issue is what I worry about. Okay, so they put in place this, this lockdown effort. First of all, how much are people gonna adhere to that? And the second thing is, um, uh, you know, like that's, th that's like putting on the brakes to the train, but this train is hurtling forward and it's gonna be three weeks or more before you start to see the ICU numbers drop. Um, to be clear here, in case you don't follow it, People come in these days, predominantly younger people, a large part with the new variants, P117, P1. It's, it's a lot of young people who come in and they've got to stay. Each person who occupies an ICU bed will stay for three weeks. So one ICU bed goes real quick. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of people to occupy all ICU beds because, you know, um, if you have 21 ICU beds, uh, they fill up in 21 days and they're not gonna be available for weeks, right? Um, uh, even if you have only one person a day who needs it. Um, so I, I don't, uh, I know they're, they're, they're really not bad, but the other thing I, uh, I mean, not good, I, I, but what I don't have, which I do have for Saskatchewan is, is ICU support numbers. Um, like. Like in Saskatchewan, I know pretty well what the ICU capacity is. And it's easy to fool yourself. Um, you know, it's easy to go say, we're gonna buy more ventilators. Let's use not ventilators by and large. It's skilled nursing teams, skilled you know, cross-disciplinary teams to support the ventilators. You can have the mechanical ventilators, but you need people who are really skilled to run them or the ECMO machines. And, and um, and so you can't, it's, it's really hard to buy yourself out of it. It takes, you know, a long time of training to build up these teams. And uh, I don't know what those numbers are for Alberta. I know what they are for Saskatchewan and they are not encouraging um, in terms of numbers. We don't have a lot. Um, and uh, we have been scared at times that we could exceed them. So um, I need to know what those are for Alberta. We've just been funded to do major modeling with our ABM for Alberta. So this summer, I'm looking for students to work with me to adapt our ABM to Alberta. Um, and so we can run Alberta scenarios and we're gonna be putting all that sort of stuff in there. And we're gonna be looking at what it takes to achieve real herd immunity, sustained herd immunity in light of waning of vaccination, in light of variants, in light of people who circulate in different venues, different ages, all those sort of things. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at that for Alberta as well as Saskatchewan. And that's funded by the uh, Canadian Immunization Research Network, but it uh, involves Ministry of Health in Alberta, uh, SHA here, et cetera. So, um, you know, we'll know a lot more by the end of the summer. I wish I could offer an answer, but scientifically I, I can't because I, I don't remember the numbers. If you're really, really interested, you know, I could I could uh, talk with Xiao Yan and see see what they said, but it was pretty grim. I remember that. That's very informative. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions.
I can ask, can I ask you a question, please? So where are we going at this point in time with the predictions? And do you have any intention of publishing these predictions online so that people can view them in a public manner? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Both very good questions. Um, so um, you may have seen in one of my slides, maybe two of them, um, comments to the effect that one of the things I would do differently is get guaranteed time and place for, um, for publication. There's a lot of goodwill, a lot of goodwill um, to help us publish. A um, lot of recognition that was part and parcel of this. It's a big difference between that and saying, yeah, you can take the time to actually go do it um, because everything is firefighting. It's like, we need this, we need that, that thing's overdue. We gotta get to that. We're gonna you know, miss that outbreak. We don't, we need to inform that team on the ground here. We, we need to get these numbers for that. We need to get this presentation ready or else you know, we're not gonna be able to inform this decision. It, it's just constant, nonstop firefighting. Um, and you know, when you're up till past midnight every single night, for at least six months straight, um, you um, you don't have too much capacity to put into going through the ethics review board. So, so this work, to be clear, this work is not research according to the standards of the health system. That may sound weird for those from computer science. It sounds weird yet to my ear, but what it means is it's deemed delivery work, it's deemed system improvement work, it's deemed operational work for the health system. It's not deemed like paper writing research work yet. It will be, but to do that, you have to go through ethics. Before that, since we're embedded in the health system, we don't have to go through ethics because we're, we're operating within the sphere of the health system with confidentiality agreements. We're not letting any information out outside the health system, et cetera. And there's this big difference between that um, in order to get it published, we have to kind of go through all these heavy lifting processes. And believe me, this is not a, you know, your standard REB. This is not your standard, uh, you know, ethics review board project. <laughs> um, and, and so we have to go through that. Um, and, you know, it's always the important but not urgent thing gets deferred for the urgent and all too often not, not important thing. And we've been living with this. Right now, we're, we're actually trying to push this forward. We're actually writing some papers and we, we got to get them out there. We've been very good about sharing our models. People write to us, yeah, we share your models. Sure, yeah, we've got to share models um, with others. And that's been really helpful. There have been papers published on some of our modeling without my name on it. Um, uh, because they really wanted the model. They were partners, they needed it for Australia. And, and it's not the main folks at ACT, it's another group. And, and they said, look, could we invest in this? We'll pay you for this model. It didn't have any health system data. I said, yeah, sure, go, go do it. Um, I don't have time to publish on it now. And they published on it and power, power to them. That's great. Um, we'll publish this stuff. Uh, we, we, gotta, we gotta do it, we'll work on papers right now for it. I'm determined to do this, to really put a big push, but I need air support from the health authority. I need, I need the ministry and the health authority to back us because we invested our hearts and souls into these models for the health authority and we need their backing to get them through ethics review board because it's very non-standard stuff. And so this is what we're going through right now. And um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think there's a lot of support just today, I got a, a very, very kind letter from the from the Minister of Health personally and the um, the SHA uh, CEO um, Scott Livingston, as well as Max Hendricks, Minister of Health, thanking us for this work of service. And really, that letter is is for all all those who have contributed to this. So we got to do that. Now, where is this going? Um, So where it's going seems pretty clear to me um, at this point. Um, 
there's some details on the way that I'm not sure about. I'm not sure how bad this summer is going to get. It depends a lot on what P1 does. P1 is the Brazil um, originating uh, doubly mutated uh, virus. It also depends on whether mutations transfer horizontally. So that model I was making of AMR back on January 23rd when the news hit, that actually has some relevance here because mutations can go from one lineage to another lineage. And, and so there are these mutations that can make the dominant lineage now B117 much worse. Um, so there's a big question about how bad it's going to be in summer and fall. Where it's going is pretty clear, though. It's going to an endemic state where there's going to be periodic outbreaks uh, here, and there's, most people are going to be vaccinated, and they need to get back, uh, vaccine booster shots that track each year's, um, each year's variants. Um, it's not unlike that of the flu, the case of the flu. That's what we do each year. We track, we track the different mutations of it, and each year they put together the special sauce for that year which tries to second guess what the uh, proportion of different variants are out there, different lineages, and protect you against those that are around just then. And, and that's kind of where we're going, except it's going to be much worse. It's going to be you know, things that can kill people more readily, even young people. And um, people with immunocomp or immunocompromised, people with restrictive lung conditions, um, people who are uh, dealing with uh, great frailty and older age, I'm, I'm quite afraid. The therapeutics are advancing as well. And those are gonna help a lot if you can get someone into care soon. And a lot of the problems with young people is they're not, they develop shortness of breath, they're developing bad cough and they're not coming in soon enough. And they're a mess when they come in and they, they put them into the ICU and they intubate them immediately. And it's horrible. They, they put a hole in their throat, which is gonna be with them for the rest of their life. And that's what happens in our province. And everyone who's in the ICU is basically intubated. And a lot of them are young people. And they are there for weeks and weeks and weeks because they're likely to live, but they'll be living with scarred tissue, fibrosis, et cetera, for decades, uh, for many of them. And, and that's tragic. They may also be living with clotting issues and you know issues to heart damage, and, and it's terrible. Um, our therapeutics are, are advancing, but those only help when people get to care. If they're not coming to care soon enough, a lot of damage can be done before that. Um, so this bug is mutating, it's shape-shifting, it's, it's changing around, it's getting worse and worse. There's this triple variant from India that I'm following, B1617. You know, there's, there's this one of this, this P1 and B1351 seems to be on its way out, but it's also really nasty. They're immune evading. For the regular or for the regular vaccines not too effective against it listen everyone on this call if you're only gotten one shot of the vaccine you're still quite susceptible to infection by b1 by uh, b117 b117 can break through one dose of pfizer it protects maybe 20 percent 30 percent watch out b117 is the dominant strain out there right now it's the dominant lineage and P1 is worse. P1 is more immune evading, it has worse clinical outcomes, and, 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 and it, it, it also has probably greater transmittivity, although the evidence there is not clear. P1 is going crazy in Western Canada because of a bunch of partiers in Whistler who spread it there like crazy. And now it's gone gangbusters in BC and Alberta. And now it's coming, it's pouring into Saskatchewan more and more. And it's really dangerous with one dose vaccine only. Um, you may think you're a young person, you're immune to it, you ain't. Most of our ICU patients now, probably half or more are, are young people. Um, we had someone just yesterday who had died in their 20s or below. Um, there's, there's a lot of tragedies here. Each of those over 500 deaths has been a tragedy. And a lot of them are occurring in young people now and they're gonna be living with this for their lives. So single doses are still hurting. The good news is, the good news is that with a single dose, you're much better protected about, against hospitalization, but you can still spread it and you can spread it to your friends. And you can give the gift that keeps on giving to your friends. Um, it's very dangerous. So young people, watch out. You're not immune to it. You're, 
with one dose, we're bet much better protected against, against um, hospitalization. Maybe it's like 80% decrease or something like that. But we're still not, it's not like 99%. Second dose makes the world a difference with, with Pfizer. And it's a lot better with AstraZeneca. But, um, um, you know, we got to really watch out. Um, we got to get kids vaccinated. Um, now, so where's this going? Three years now, four years now? I expect I'm going to be worrying about COVID-19 four years from now. Uh, I'm wor worried that I'm going to bring it to my parents. I'm worried that I'm going to transmit it to others um, when I travel. Um, and uh, we're going to be wearing masks a lot more. Um, we're going to be getting our vaccines, but we shouldn't be leaning on them entirely. Um, and um, we'll just be a lot more sure we're unlikely to die from it. Um, uh, unless, you know, we're very rash and, and don't come in, uh, even when we're showing symptoms. Um, but uh, it's going to turn into a recurrent thing, and we're going to be picking up the pieces of mental health issues, rehab issues, uh, dislocation, um, uh, and uh, substance abuse issues, et cetera, for a long time hence. Um, that's where it's going, and it ain't grim. I mean, it is grim, and it ain't a pretty, pretty thing. But we'll be, you know, we'll be circulating. We go to conferences in person a lot. I think um, um, it's just uh, I fear a lot for parts of the world that don't have access to vaccines. My my heart goes out to them, and you know, Canada suffered from that a lot because our supply chains were disrupted by the U.S. by the Trump administration playing vaccine nationalism card, and by the EU um, playing nice, uh, playing tight with their vaccines. And uh, we're paying the price right now in terms of these variants. I do expect new variants to come up and maybe eventually it'll get less virulent. It'll become like cold. I, I don't think that's gonna occur that soon. And there'll probably be worse strains yet that come about. That's where I think it's going. Other question? Just a follow-up question on that. So if we, like if the model is going to be public is there any plans to get the public be aware of these models so that politicians won't be politicians will be pressured to make better decisions because i've been having gone through the covid pro like with the british variant you know in their family got infected you know in my case it was a big struggle but we got released in 10 days after the, even if we had the symptoms, we got released in 10 days. So that's a big surprise to us mm. because the public system is wanting to, looks like for me, the public system is wanting to count towards the numbers to, uh, to keep the politician at peace as opposed to making the right decision of public safety. Right. In, in spite of that, we decided to stay in the household for the last three weeks to keep ourselves contained. Mm. But mm. if these models are going to be published out to the public awareness, then the politicians could be pressured to make the right decisions in terms of the public health perspective rather than the uh, pro-business perspective. Yeah. Is there any plans on that? Yeah, it's it's a very good question. And, you know, I, 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 I think, I think what you're saying is very interesting. And I think there's actually a, a possibility of this. I, I know how influential we're told our models were in influencing some of the communities in our province, uh, particularly those in the North, um, you know, on, on the importance of, of uh, for example, mask wearing, but trade off between different interventions. And I, I do think that th there's a potential there for, for really good public education. I'm not going to say it's going to include everyone. Um, you know, we're never going to persuade everyone. But um, th there is a chance that politicians could feel heat by these short-sighted decisions. I don't, I didn't see a lot of evidence of that ca callous or that cynical type of decision making in Saskatchewan. I didn't, I didn't see any evidence of that. And, and I, again, I, I did disagree quite strongly with some some people, um, 
but I, I thought they were coming from a reasonable perspective, not a perspective that was immoral or you know objectionable in the face of it. Um, now, um, uh, in I don't think that's true of all jurisdictions. Like in the U.S., it was very clear the last administration was not playing, um, you know, honestly, and uh, was abusing the the, the trust. Uh, I mean, just a case in point. Diamond Princess, that cruise ship, that doomed cruise ship, right? That sailed around with, you know, a, a very large fraction of their crew and passengers ill with coronavirus. Um, that ship wasn't allowed to formally discharge passengers in the US for a long time because the president of the US at the time one Donald J. Trump um, said that he didn't want the numbers of the US cases to go up. And if they came off the ship, they would be deemed US cases and therefore would make the US look bad. Um, so bringing them to hospitals on the mainland, he deemed as a harm to to you know what he was seeking because it would make him look bad because suddenly you know the number of cases in the U.S. would go up by 200, and that is you know just such benighted thinking, everything backwards about it that um, it just cries out for moral objection, and um, it's abusing trust in the worst way. And I do believe a lot of that was going on in the states. Um, I speak as a U.S. citizen. Um, and um, uh, I know the ways of my kind. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this, this was happening a lot. And I, um, I think that um, you're right that there is some gamesmanship going on. Um, I do think that there's, together with the wishful thinking, um, in, even in our province, there's you know, wanting to put the best spin on it. There's wanting, not wanting unwelcome information. Like I, I do sometimes wonder if some of the reasons the province didn't want to make use of certain data sources um, was that maybe it would destabilize the situation, would rock the boat. It, it, it might suggest something unwelcome. Um, I don't totally rule that out. I don't want to impute that, but it is possible. Um, you know, what we don't know won't kill us, the idea. Um, and, and that's, I think, fairly objectionable too, actually. And I think that may have been going on. Um, uh, even let's not run the, there was a lot of cases of where we could have been asked to run scenarios on our model and we weren't. And then as soon as the policy was announced, we were told, go run this, go run it and tell us what's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like you already decided this, right? Um, uh, like, look, what do you want to want to tell us what's going to happen? They say, tell us how many lives that we'll save. Okay, um, compared to the old scenario, yeah, we could try to estimate that, but it's kind of weird. Like, you're not telling us to after, but maybe it was because they didn't want to know beforehand. They didn't want to have that pesky modeling thing get in the way and say, oh, there's even a better solution. It'll be this, you know. They didn't want it to get in the, you know, get complicated with their calculations. They wanted to, you know, just let's let's decide this. No, no, you know, fancy song and dance. Let's just get this thing done and then we can evaluate it. And there's a lot of that. A lot. A lot. And um, you know, that's a um that's something where the public were able to be educated and were able to run things. You might have an empowerment. The real question there in many ways, I think is public education efforts. Uh, like, like you gotta put in the efforts to make it accessible. You gotta put in the efforts to make it easily accessed and, and nice to use, and, you know, clear and easy to share and collaborate around and, and uh, transparent in terms of, of what it really means. So people don't confuse new infection count with new case count, which are very different in the situation where we only find a fraction of all infection, all infectives. 
you know, the number of cases is going to be a lot smaller and it's easy for people who are not used to thinking they have to get that in mind. But I, I actually think there's an empowerment strategy there that's quite intriguing. And I do think you'd get pressure on politicians, maybe not from most people, right? Maybe your average, you know, working bloke who's not going to um, have time to do this, but you might get a large enough block of people who are recently educated and say, look, this cannot stand. This does not make sense. This is going to lead to disaster. And these three models all agree on it, right? Um, I, I'm not a big believer in putting our eggs into one modeling basket. This is one of the reasons we built so many models is for different uses, yes, but also to make sure we're not blowing smoke to you know, have some other points of reference, particularly early on. Double check our understanding is, did we miss anything in this model? What, and and you know, I would want to have several models. And that's where our particle filtering solution is going, by the way. I want to get several models and they're running simultaneously in giving consensus estimates. And if you add that online for the public, man, you could, you could do a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and, and you could get some pretty educated people putting some heat on saying, look, the three most widely admired models in the world are all saying this is going to be dangerous. So do I, do I think there's possibility there? Yeah, I just, I think it's a, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it requires a lot of effort and it requires a lot of expertise that I personally don't have, but which people collectively on this call within our department have user interface design, engagement of people in collaborative systems, you know, um, uh, rich um, accessible websites and, um, and, you know, tools for um, really, you know, boiling down complex information into a, a hard hitting visualization. Those are things which within our department, there's a lot of expertise. And, and I do think a site like that could go very far. One of my regrets from this project is we amassed a massive amount of information, a massive, you know, we go and harvest all these web pages daily and just get all this information. Lutia has added all these web pages and we're, we're just scraping them and, and adding them in. And, uh, you know, for months and months, so we're tallying things up and keeping track of every case in Canada till the date and all sorts of stuff. I, I wish we had had a couple of students who could have put that all online and shared it. And I believe we'd be like Johns Hopkins in getting worldwide traffic, you know, in the potentially in the millions and at least in the hundreds of thousands to U of S. I knew it was possible. I just didn't have the time. And, you know, in, in retrospect, um, I probably should have tasked one of my more senior students for it with that. Um, uh, okay. Um, other, okay, so there's a question. Care to comment on university opening? Um, hmm, private message. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainties about what's going to pl play out in late summer. If you had talked to me two months then, even six months, six weeks then, if you had talked to me six weeks ago, um, I would have been more bullish about the summer. Now I'm worried. Um, I'm worried because P1's exploding. I'm worried because first doses of Pfizer are not proving very efficacious against the variants, even B117, vanilla B117. Uh, worse clinical outcomes, uh, faster spread, but not terribly immunivating. 20% efficacy against, you know, it, 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 it's just not very efficacious against protecting you. It's, um, and we're all, you know, those of us who have the doses right now, we're probably all first dosers. And I'm worried about that. I'm, I'm worried it's going to keep on, keep on spreading. Um, I did tentatively support the provinces rolling out first doses before going on to most second doses. Uh, I thought given the shortages we have, that was probably make sense when we get the more, we're gonna go in, in second doses. I just say, get those soon and, and let's give them because there's a big gap opening up in efficacy for in, in effectiveness in the population between first and second dose. And that evidence was not all there early on. And, and so we need to get that in place. Um, and so like late summer, I'm worried about, I, I'm pretty worried about it. Um, 
there were there was good evidence to believe that warmer temperatures tamp down spread. Um, and there's some interesting literature on this. Um, you know, good studies, meta-analyses, I think, look at this. And really good stuff. But once variants come into the situation, it's different. Look what's going on. It just breaks your heart in India. Exporting so many vaccines, providing vaccines for the world at such cost. Um, you look what went on in Brazil horrible, you know, rates of reinfection. People infected twice in the same city, Manos, in the upper Amazon. Horrible um, with the variants. Um, overriding, you know, vaccination efforts. And I'm worried. I'm worried because P1, the lineage that did that in Brazil, is here and it's here now and it's spreading in our province and it's gangbusters over in Alberta. And it's been even worse over in, uh, in BC. Um, and, you know, when I talk with our colleagues over there in Alberta, I think on last Friday, you know, it was, it was Edmonton had it, Cal had an outbreak. Calgary had an outbreak. The oil sands have an outbreak, which serves a lot of Saskatchewan, you know, um, labor pool. It's coming here and it's gonna be up in the north and it's gonna be in the cities and it's in Saskatoon as we speak. And I'm worried. Um, I'm worried we may not in the end be able to open up our, our university as much as I would love to see you folks in person. I'm worried about that. Um, I'm worried if we do open up that we'll see that surge later. The temperature dependence that I thought might be, uh, you know, make the balance. I, I'm worried, but our our province did announce this, you know, this plan of opening up only based on meeting vaccine targets. And they should have simulated. They should have asked us to simulate it ahead of time. Yet another case where they didn't. But we can simulate it now. And uh, you know, I, I think that's a lot better than what a lot of other provinces are doing, actually. We'll say it's at eighty percent, but. Um, it's a hard goal. I'm, I'm not sure they're going to be able to meet it. Get your friends vaccinated. Get your family vaccinated. We need everyone vaccinated as much as possible. And that's what will allow for reopening. Um, that's safe. Um, so vaccines are it, but single dose is fragile. Other questions? I love these questions. So I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the model would be available to us. Do you mean like a, any, any logic file would be available so we can mess around with it? I'm a previous student of yours, so I just wanted to see if, yeah. you know, yeah? Yeah, if you, if you want to poke around, I mean, we'd ask you, you know, not to, not to go um, publish it in your name only, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And we'd, we'd ask you not to, um, go and modify it um, and, and put our names on it, um, right? Mm -hmm. and, and say, this is, this is a simple model where it's not. Um, and the, the thing we will have to do is just make sure that no data is you know, built in with it and so on. Um, so mm -hmm. we need to do a bit of diligence like we did with Yukon Territory or like we did with Australia Capital Territory. Um, and, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to have transparent models and while we can't publish them in the public domain yet until we go through ethics, I, I do want to share them. And so if, if you're interested in, in kind of take a look at it and, and would agree to, you know, terms of use for that, uh, for take a look, I'm, I'm glad to, to let you learn from the model. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I had, a quick, I had a quick question. Um, so this pandemic has been a real time of, of learning over like a, a really quick period of, of time, especially in terms of how the public and how data scientists and how everybody understands models and metrics related to public health. Like, I think within the last year, we saw the emergence of things like 
excess mortality or test positivity, which weren't really on people's radars or maybe even didn't exist prior to this pandemic. And you've also, it seems like the team has learned a lot in terms of deploying models as a service, not just as like an entire package that you're just sort of creating, but like how you integrate it with organizations and how it evolves and so forth. So I guess my question would be like, if another different pandemic hit a couple of years from now, what are sort of the learnings that you'd take from this pandemic in trying to build another modeling system? Let's set aside issues of like data access or finances because those are it's separate problems. But aside from those, like what, what would you start with first or what would you not do first now, knowing what you know? Yeah, um, I think this is a great question. And like many great questions, uh, you know, it, it requires some thinking to really do it justice. Um, I'll, I'll give some comments off the cuff. Um, but, you know, I, I'd like to internalize it. So I think we're actually like far beyond, I, uh, beyond where we were at the beginning in it, in a, in terms of capital assets or in persist, things of persistent value, assets, I won't say capital assets, but assets. And, and it's interesting because like one of the assets is the system that Lugia and Aaron and Eric and Viom um, have built up, which is world leading. And, and like, we could use that for anything. I mean, you could use it for, you know, uh, nosocomial infection outbreaks at an institutional level. You could use it for province-wide foodborne illness outbreaks. You could use it for any number of conditions. You could use it for chronic disease, but things are slow enough moving there. You know, the needs wouldn't be there to update more than once a month or something, but you could still use it. But it's for fast moving things. It's like awesome. And, and nosocomial infection is great. Flu, great. You know, all these different bugs. Um, so like that's an asset that would put us, we'd be so far ahead. I mean, if we had had that at the beginning, that's like the crown jewels. I mean, we could have cleaned up house. Um, you know, we, we could have just, we would have been the cat's meow, you know, cat's meow in the catbird seat. I mean, it was awesome. Um, so, and, and there's nothing like that in the world, I'm aware of. Um, and uh, that is nothing about COVID-19. It, it, it's nothing about COVID-19. It's about a general framework for service, for turning models into services. And that has legs. Um, and we are planning to use those legs. These legs were meant for walking. Um, and I won't expand on that now, but I, I, I'm determined to not let that undergo bit rod. And there may even be a commercial side and not anti-business. Um, uh, but um, I will say beyond that, probably the single biggest asset that's been built up was the one to which you referred. Janelle, one recognizes the lion by its claw. Um, and uh, and that, that is the learning that's gone on in the healthcare system and the public health system, two different things, for where models fit in, how they can be used, why they're useful, where they're not useful and where they secure their greatest benefit, et cetera. Um, it's in that context, in the context of the, um, building up of understanding the healthcare system and health system that I think the biggest gains are to be had because, you know, how are you gonna keep them down on the farm once they've seen Paris? Um, I'll share with you, those still with us, that um, I was given a very strong proposition by the health system before I chose to leave and to return to my lab. Um, and to focus on my lab students and to focus on my teaching. Um, there's a lot of interest using models ubiquitously through our health system now for you know, diverse conditions. Um, and there's a real interest in institutionalizing it and, and having a very close working relationship with academic side, all sorts of things. And there's a time to discuss that, um, but I didn't want to do it, you know, 
I had two major things go on in the past year um, that have changed me as in very significant ways. And it left me in some ways a, a different person. I've emerged from the river a different person in some ways. Uh, one of them was the pandemic. That was actually the lesser thing. There was another personal thing that went on that, that is not um, suitable for discussion here. But um, the um, it was transposed, uh, top, uh, superimposed on the pandemic. And I will say that, um, you know, when it comes to um, uh, taking advantage of the insatiable desire now for our health system in modeling and using it to inform decision making in varied ways, not just in crystal ball ways, that we are just light years ahead of where we were before. And if our system is like that, you can only imagine what BC is like, what Alberta is like, what Manitoba is like, what, you know, Ontario, Quebec, et cetera. Um, this is a general yearning. And I, I know from other provinces, because I talk with the modelers every week, um, that there's a lot of uh, interest there. So we are seeing a great awakening when it comes to analytics and modeling. And we're seeing data sources once dismissed as the province of hackers and, and kind of people toying around, you know, social media data, search data, mobility data, smartphone contact data, you know, data on, on, on um, uh, things like uh, wastewater. We're seeing those recognized as assets and huge assets of huge value in ways that, you know, when I went to that, to that uh, meeting at the minute with the Ministry of Health for the data analysis oversight group on February 28th and had that conversation with Jenny Basran on the way there and back. Um, and I put those forward, it was kind of like, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I guess that could be useful. Um, um, I think there was a lot of sense. Well, we, don't, we don't really do that in the health system. And now it's like, yeah, like give us that data. We need it. You know, and we know how to use it. We know why it's relevant. And there's all these uses now by people in the health system of Google mobility reports, trying to read the tea leaves and you know, trying to understand what's going on uh, by understand with with mobility data collected from from smartphones and people playing Candy Crush while it secretly records their location and stuff like that, and it's sold you know to to bidders to to, to buy it and and I think that's been a sea change, and so I would say a lot of the barriers have been relieved and it's not by accident. Many a time I thought is this really worth it? And I thought, yeah, I'll persist. I'll stick by this. Jenny Bassman, the same thing. And we stuck by it and we slowly drop by drop is the water jar filled. Um, and the water jar is now full. And I think the next big acute care crisis, the demand is just gonna be insatiable, but they're gonna want the sort of thing we built with daily updates and encounters with data. They're gonna want the new data sources. They're gonna be informed consumers, not passive consumers who need to be totally educated. And for us as computer scientists, for us as computer scientists who wield the power of modeling and big data, data scientists, the sky and the possibilities are wide open in Saskatchewan and beyond. So I, I think, that is probably the biggest change. Now, what would I do differently? Well, there's a lot I don't have to do now. Um, and so I would, I'm gonna put a lot of our bets on these models as services. Um, I'm gonna put a lot of our bets into generalizing that and using multiple model ensembles. So we're not putting our eggs in one basket. We can use models picked out for by clients or, or selected based on what's available. Um, I'm gonna put our efforts into making these things better and better link in with, with these big data sources. Um, I think we gotta position ourselves though for, for greater use of modeling yet, because I think the health system has learned how basically where basically many aspects of where modeling fit in and how to use it as a basic level. But I think they need to be taken beyond that and I think there needs to be human resource capacity invested so that they actually hire people with modeling backgrounds. And that means huge demand for things like boot camps um, 
and, and building up expertise by the health system and, um, and how, to, how to actually have expertise that can use modeling and interpret modeling internally. Um, so I think investing in education is really important there. Um, I think on the data side, there is a lot of ugliness on the data side within the health system. Like there's a lot of balkanization and the, the pandemic like burst through a lot of that. A lot of these barriers like just like, like that cannot be crossed. It was crossed the next day, it was just boom. And um, I think there's a reckoning after the pandemic that's got to go through that prevents that falling back. And, um, you know, the cynical voices out there say, oh, come on, they're going to love modeling as long as the crisis goes on. But once it's passed, they're going to go back to their old ways. I actually don't believe that. I, I think there's been enough change. And um, I think it will stick at some level. And I think there is going to be this investment. And we've just got to be ready for it because we're not, I think, as a discipline and as a training, you know, in terms of the training numbers, I think there's such an imbalance between demand and supply um, for people who can do this sort of work that we've got to up our game there. Um, those are some thoughts. The balkanization is very real. There were things that killed us. We wanted to do the analysis, but the data wasn't available. We still don't have data requested in March, desperately requested. We don't have data to distinguish between active case finding and passive case finding. People who are found by the healthcare system versus people who find the healthcare system because they're feeling symptoms. Like very basic things, like what people are we going out and finding versus coming in, big difference um, in interpreting the underlying situation, um, but I'm not finding it. And similarly, some basic things like the home addresses associated with people, our home communities are different in two different IT systems for the same person. One says they live in Saskatoon, another says they live in Pelican Narrows or they live up in White Fox. And I mean, um, come on folks, we can, we can do better than that. Um, a lot of the things which got in the way of us were data entry things. The data was there, but it was all handwritten and they had to enter it and they couldn't pay someone to enter it. It was gonna take three people full-time work to go through and enter these things. And we don't have the budget to do it. So it's not gonna be done. Come on, let's get beyond that, right? Pen and paper, do we really need that these days? Um, uh, they did use GoData. They used a mobile app to do contact tracing information sharing. That was a big step forward. They almost used Ethica for collecting data with, uh, with respect to surveys and, and pushing out information on COVID. Maybe next time they'll do, do more on the smartphone front. I think the data side, I really want to push on because together with the models, oh man, they, they sing. Um, and we got to do, do more on that side. So that's a bunch of grab bag thoughts, but I hope that's useful. Great, thank you. Yeah, a lot of possibilities. It's exciting times. Not necessarily in always a good way, but it's exciting. And, you know, things that aren't exciting in a good way ask, lead people to ask, what can we do differently? Um, and there's a lot of people asking. This is actually a profound thing. A lot of, I said, this burst through a lot of barriers. And I'm, I'm less hopeful, but still a little bit hopeful that one of the barriers that it, it breaks through is siloed handling of things on, take mental health and addictions. Um, you take suicide prevention. Um, you take, um, well, addiction side, substance use versus mental health. These are issues that are, are they health issues? Yeah, they're health issues, but they're also social issues. They're also criminal justice issues when it comes to substance use and suicide prevention, et cetera. There's a lot of these things that cross barriers. And finally, we're seeing some attempts to say, yeah, this is super important. We got to merge these data. We got to link them up. We got to make sense. And we have to put efforts into place to do that um, in a non-slapdash fashion, a way that preserves privacy and ensures, um, ensures uh, confidentiality and, and the ethics are ensured while not dis disenfranchising those who, are, who, who aren't digitally equipped, et cetera. And there's a big 
goal there to undertake. So we're not blinding ourselves at the same time as we're supplementing our data. And Janelle, you know exactly the, of the sort of things I'm concerned about, disadvantaging you know, black and brown people, um, you know, ma making sure that we, we can privilege, uh, uh, privilege um, you know, those who are marginalized um, within our imagination so we don't neglect them. Um, uh, alienated individuals uh, who don't happen to seek care aren't squeezed out and, and uh, left on, on with their needs unmet, et cetera. And there's a lot of equity issues, I think, that are needed to really take the next revolution you know, to a level that's really embracing of the communities. And I'm very hopeful there, but um, um, it, ne it needs more than technologists. It needs humane technologists, technologists who are educated and these issues of, of, of um, you know, how technology impacts equity and how it impacts uh, concerns associated with uh, marginalization, et cetera. And that's, that, that takes uh, educational investment too. Other questions? Concerns on efficacy for the second dose of a vaccine when receiving it later than the recommended time. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the subject of a lot of discussions in front of the chief medical officer by uh, people above my pay grade. And um, actually some people, I mean, on less joking, I mean, um, there's some people who are more vaccine expert than, than I am. And um, I trust their judgments. There was a lot of worry about it. Um, I was more concerned that they were as well about like in the States, there was actually efforts to like split doses in two. And so you'd give half the amount to each person. Um, and that's much more risky yet. Uh, I am concerned about this dosing um, spreading out um, not because of its impact on the average person. I mean, when you work in health for a while, you realize just like there's no average day, there's no average person. It's, it's a fiction. And um, the problem is that uh, a lot of things that are, um, that are formulated uh, are formulated with kind of your average person in mind and it ends up falling flat um, for those who are most at risk. Um, those who are immunocompromised, those who are who, whose immune systems are, are quite weak because they're very frail in the oldest ages of life. Um, uh, you know, other other groups who are who are really disenfranchised, or, or sorry, you know, who's I think it's particularly with immune system issues, they're taking uh, immunosuppressants for transplants, et cetera. And and there's a lot of big concerns there with the first dose not being enough. And they're still left only very vulnerable. And those are the people we most want to protect. And yet the first dose, if it's offered one size fits all, everyone gets the first dose only. As this is being done here uh, these days, you know, it, it's a real problem. And I, I think the province was asleep at the switch on that side. They needed a much more textured policy for how to roll things out, not just age, and to prioritize two doses for people who most need it, they didn't do it. And I'm worried about that. Um, we seek to lower, you know, the, the, the hospitalization and, you know, secure in the understanding that for normal COVID, for conventional lineage, you know, it really lowers vaccination rates only after even just the first dose. But for, for these other folks and for the variants, it's not very effective. And, and I'm really concerned about them. Um, so they shouldn't have done it in the blunt way they did. And in a general, I, you know, I think there's a lot of rooms for improvement over vaccination strategy. Um, our comments were not sought on how to roll out the vaccines. Um, there was a lot of interest in having us assess what the impacts of the vaccines were likely to be but um, it was not seen as being in our lane to look at the actual vaccine prioritization and rollout. Um, I'll leave it there. 
so so yeah i'm i'm, I'm concerned uh, there is some evidence that being said there's some evidence to suggest that for people with strong immune systems um and maybe even for those without if, if they you know live live that full time to the second dose that they actually may be better protected by the second dose than they would have been if the second dose had been given just weeks after like per manufacturer's specification and and uh, some sensibility to that um people wane in their immunity over time and if they've been waning for half a year and then you give that second dose bam you bring them way up and now they're protected again at a high level whereas if you've given it back six months minus two weeks ago um you know they they will have waned down and so you know some trade-offs there these are subtle things you need a model to look at this and you know i wish we've been given the chance to do some modeling of this because i think we could have shed some pretty big light on how to do it better but we would have been inconvenient i think um in terms of uh you know fast tracking the rollout and i understand it was on a fast track i just wish we had been sought earlier about it other questions uh, this is like super fun for me i, I just someone one of my students in 394858 asked like do you ever get sick of talking about covid covid is not just covid it's like all sorts of things it gets into. So um, no, I'm not going to be sick about talking about COVID. Um, how um, mumble? Um, how easy, difficult would it be to make the models independent, proprietary softwares, and attempt to to open source them? Yeah, um, I mean, open source can be done when they're still run proprietary. Uh, any logic is available, you know, for a free training edition. Um, but you know. I uh, I would like to break free of that uh, and eventually to you know ha have it have it in a framework that's that that doesn't have any sort of paywalls associated with it. Um, I think that would be a an admirable thing. And we the, we actually have uh, an effort in our lab that was directed towards exactly that goal, um, which uh, has a large part of the ABM model built up as of a certain date. But the ABM model barreled forward. And I don't think this model has kept up. This version of the model in Julia has kept up with it. Um, it. It confers a lot of other advantages. Run WIP fast. It could be part of an ABM um, it, it combined with particle filtering potentially. Um, there's a lot of needs to bring it outside of uh, of the of the AnyLogic framework for certain needs. And I'm keen to do that. It's just you know. A, we, we can't find enough talented people to do this, these sort of work. Uh, if someone's really interested, um, they should talk with me because um, we're looking for people right now. And uh, I'm afraid we'll have to turn down the university to do the university model because we, we just can't find someone um, to do it. So, um, so we, we need good people to do this. And um, I need to be able to sleep at night and all my students, I wanna be able to sleep many, many hours. Especially the heroes who have worked tirelessly. Uh, other questions? So, this is the first talk of at least three. Um, I'm going to um, uh, be putting together two more technical talks on the ABM on the one hand and on the um, particle filter, particle on CMC. And those will have a lot more nitty gritty um, and uh, responsive to the computer science audience will be ensuring that it, it speaks about, you know, some implementation issues, performance issues, uh, memory footprint, um, you know, issues of, of implementation and you know, possibility of taking it outside of that framework and advantages for doing so. 
Well, we talked about lots of other trade-offs um, that are not obvious. Um, and that Routier, for example, Eric, Aaron, Viom had to sweat. Um, uh, we'll also be talking about where this framework for running these models, turning any model into a service, Maybe I'm, glossing, I'm exaggerating a bit by saying any model, but lots of models into services where that is going to, to go. And, and I have great hope uh, about that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this framework that's been built up is, um, is nothing short of revolutionary in terms of delivery of value of, from models. And I think it can be model agnostic in the sense that lots of people could put models into it. Um, uh, rather than it imposing one model choice. Um, so uh, we'll be exploring these issues uh, in more in coming lectures and um, I'll look forward to uh, entertaining more questions there. So if you have more questions, I'm, I'm glad to talk about them. Um, I am planning um, to hold sessions that are more question and answer sessions Kind of fireside chats about COVID for the graduate students and uh, for others uh, who are, you know, interested in um, uh, in this issue. I might even hold them with graduate students outside our department. Um, so, um, you know, these sort of back and forth questions about COVID more generally. I welcome. I recognize this is our lives now. It's our lives of our families. This is, you know, our day-to-day -day experience. It shapes our educational trajectory. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to informing uh, those, um, those discussions uh, with the limited knowledge I do have. Um, but, you know, the, the very up-to-date knowledge that tries to stay constantly on top of things. So, so we'll be doing that in um, coming weeks and months as a part of my public service. Okay. Okay. Anyone have anything final they want to put forward? Any burning questions at the last minute? Okay. Well, oh. Sorry, not a burning question, but um, I do want to thank you for the talk. It's been excellent. Appreciate it. Very, very kind. This is the first one I've done like this. Um, and I, I'm glad if you thought it was responsive. I had to put it together really quickly under deadlines of marking at the same time. And so um, if you found parts of it meaningful, I, I'm, I'm grateful to, to know that. It, it's good to hear. Um, it's, it's a grab bag of different things over the last year. It's been such a whirlwind, such a blur um, that, you know, I was afraid I might feel to not communicate some of the salient texture, but um, I'm glad if you felt it, it conferred some value. So uh, yeah, hopefully my, my future talks will, will offer also some, some interest. Um, great, well, thank you everyone. Um, and uh, it's been an honor uh, to serve in this capacity. I wanna thank again, you know, the incredible student leadership, um, you know, Wade, um, Xiao Yan, uh, Lu Jie, but also all the others who, who served um, and uh, some of which are, are, are here. Uh, what you've done is uh, nothing short of remarkable and has put catapulted U of S up to you know, national spotlight on, on many issues. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, my fellow department um, faculty and, and students, um, you know, it's, uh, I appreciate your accommodations during this, uh, this trying time and uh, look forward to seeing if we can lend some of these to, to the department's benefit. Thanks very much, everyone, and uh, look forward to, uh, to talking more. Take care. Thanks all so much for all the comments. Take care and stay safe. It's a nasty variant world out there. <laughs>